Hello. Hello. Hey everybody, happy Monday. You're very welcome aboard. Tonight we have part eight of our Gallic War series, The Roman Invasion of Britain. Right, happening tonight, live on the stream. I'd like to welcome everyone in. I hope you had a grand weekend. It's Monday. We don't know why, it just keeps happening. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> as you do, as you do. Um, I'll get to all the alerts now in a moment, but I uh, want to welcome you in as we kind of near the end of our Gallic Wars series. Oh, Jesus, I'm getting double the alerts. Hang on, I need to fix that. I had one job. Now we should be laughing. <laughs> Hope. Uh, but yes, we're getting close to the end of this, well, season, if you like, uh, following the Romans. And, uh, Part eight, we're eight weeks into this. So we have uh, we have this one and then two more. Uh, and then we're going to be wrapping it up for the history stuff uh, for a little while as we move on to something new. We're going to be focusing on some IL-4 ATC stuff uh, coming soon. You'll know a little bit more about it over the coming weeks. But uh, until then, well, we delve into what we have planned for tonight. And tonight in part eight. Give well, yourself to the well, dark side. Julius Caesar. He's on his way to invade Britain, right? So Caesar's expeditions in Britain, I have to read some of this, uh, occurring in 55 BC and then again in 54 BC, marked the first recorded Roman incursions onto the island of Britain. The invasions were motivated by a combination of seeking glory, some resources, even some pearls. He thought there were pearls here, the poor old devil. But he also knew that the Britons were helping resupply the Gauls be it with manpower, weaponry, resources, food, you name it. And they were, right? So our flight plan tonight, we're going to be departing out of Mannheim City. This is where we were last week, Echo Delta, Foxtrot, Mike. And we're going to ramble over then to Brussels, Echo Bravo, Bravo, Romeo for our first stop. From there, we head on over to Calais Dunkirk Airport, Lima, Foxtrot, Alpha, Charlie, before crossing the channel and arriving at Biggin Hill Airport, Echo Golf, Kilo, Bravo. But our journey doesn't end there. No, we're going to fly up over London uh, as we have a look at Elstree Aerodrome, or Elstree Aerodrome, Echo Golf Tango Romeo. So we're just overflying it. And then we have a full stop landing planned at London's Luton Airport, Echo Golf, Golf Whiskey. Now, I'm using live weather, and it's a bit of a challenge here this evening. Uh, and we're going to be flying in the Pilatus PC-12. Uh, this one from SWS. I haven't flown this in ages, so it could be rusty. You wouldn't know your luck, do you know what I mean? But uh, we'll, we'll give it a blast and see what happens. We're going to be live on the Southeast Asian server for anyone who'd like to join us along. Well, sure, come on for the spin. Flight time, just over two hours. Right? Look at him reading like a pro. What are you saying, Gibbo? I memorised all of that. Could you see me eyes move? Was I doing an awful... I'll have to watch it back, right? Captain Gaiman is here. <laughs> Now, oh, by the way, I posted a very handy check sheet. Checklist? Checklist. Let's go with a checklist. Uh, it's from Captain Gaiman, and it, it's actually part of what he uses when operating the real-world PC-12. So I popped that into the add-on section uh, in our Discord. And if anyone's new here, if you'd like to ramble It'll over, behave. exclamation point Discord into the chat, and it'll give you a link. You can click on the link and then ramble down to where it has add-ons, and you'll find the devil in there. You see, that's where it's all hiding. Do you know what I mean? So uh, just, just, there's all stuff happening here. Yeah, baby. Yeah. Oh, dear. There's all sorts of stuff going on. Um, but yes, so uh, live weather looks to be a challenge. We'll ramble over here now to the other screen in just a moment. But I want to welcome everybody in. There's tons of you here. And we're live on YouTube as well. So hello to everyone watching us on YouTube. A very happy Monday to you. Uh, Black Eyes Gabe has rambled in, subbing with a tier three. God almighty. Thank you very much indeed. Get some diddly idle going. Uh, uh, uh. Ted, come on. You're going a bit mad there. Uh. Right, here we are now. Bitter, bitter. Do you know what I mean? Uh, Black Eyes Gabe, thank you very, very much indeed, my guy. Uh, now, let me see. He says, Happy Mad Monday. Welcome in, dude. Who else is here? Vacuum. Very good to see you. Uh, Monsieur All Safe. Bonsoir, monsieur. Hope all is well. Mr. Zed Ryder, you're very ha uh, very welcome aboard. It's great to see you. Uh, Night Zepp is here. I feel so romantique tonight. Rome antique. I see what you did there. 
Oh, behave. Welcome in, man. Super Typhon rambles in. Good to see you, Super Ty. Tarnished Mossman. Welcome aboard. AJH Man. Fierce Wolf is here looking fierce and wolfy. Welcome in. Viper Strike in the house. 33 months at tier one. Thank you very, very much indeed, Viper Strike. I hope you're well. And I know you're heading away on vacation soon. So uh, enjoy, man. Enjoy. Hang on. I need to type of something very important to our team of moderators who keep us all safe and happy, warm and fuzzy on the inside. But moving on, let me see. Flying for Fun says, finally, something good to watch. <laughs> it's been a Monday that has dragged on too long. I, I know, it, listen, I know. I'm up since that time this morning and uh, right, we're only starting to kind of, what was that, huh? what was that day? We can see Friday on the, well, it's a little bit, it's, <clears throat> but we're getting to it. We've got a fun stream planned for Friday. Sun Jammer is here, it's good to see you. Spitfire, ORF, 100. Very welcome aboard. Bell Bro is here. Hide, hide, Gauls. The Romans are in sight. Imagine seeing this. There's a ton of notes for tonight, so we'll get through it now in a bit. Uh, Kozaki Flyer, good to see you. Rambok Mord is here. He said, had a blast on Vatsim yesterday. First the Wales event. Then Adam helping me get out of Dublin safely. I'm ready for a new week. Awesome stuff. Myself and two cast rambled in to have a look at Gibbo yesterday. Gibbo was flying out of, uh, or he was flying into Edinburgh. Tell me, lads, it's all ahead of us. Uh, Shuffle Shoes shuffles in. AJH, hope all is well. Filthy says, have you ever had a Monday that made you think you've already worked three days this week? <laughs> right? Uh, Goblin Zeus, good evening. Wayland Jutani is here. Andy Brown, good evening. Uh, WM Flight Sim is here. Stavarius, you're very welcome aboard. Uh, Jan Drace, tis a new week. AJH, you're very welcome in. Old Veteran965, Scott, a very happy Monday to you. Uh, Wombat is here. He says, hello, hello, and good day to all you flaming galas. <laughs> Great to see you, man. Scorpio49 rumbles in. That's a big 10 for good buddy. Just hovering off the ground. You can't see his feet moving. And he says, ye gods, that's three whole years, Murph. You must be doing something right. Pity about your, re pity about your reading skills. Scorpio has subscribed to the channel for 36 months. Thank you very, very much indeed, Scorpio. God almighty, three years, right? You'd be out in five. <clears throat> but yes, uh, let me see. Hemingbird is here. I woke up with a bed full of stir fry this morning. I must have been sleepwalking again. Happy Monday. Hope you're well. <laughs> Hope you're well. Dougal McTavish, good day, man. The chairman has rambled in. Welcome in, Dougal. Hope all is well. Rob MCR is here. Zythi, a very happy... Monday. Hope you're well, man. Uh, Captain Meowingtons. Welcome aboard. Welcome aboard. Eamon1973. He says, hello, Murphyus. <laughs> hello. Good to see you. Can uh, I get a refund? No, there's no refund. What? Get out of that garden. Uh, Soccer Pilot. Good to see you. Katie Patton is here. Welcome aboard, everybody. Soaring AJ. Yeah, baby. <laughs> there's things happening there. Uh, <clears throat> Soaring AJ. Subscribed to Tier 3 for 37 months. Thank you very, very much indeed, Soaring AJ. I hope you're well, man. Zybok Doc is in the house. Black Eyes Gabe says, question for the men on here. And it can only be aimed at the men. <laughs> have you ever sat on yourself? I have multiple times today. <laughs> Jesus. Right, we're moving on. The Romans had a name for that. It was called Ouch. Uh, <clears throat> Night Zep, good to see it. Again, uh, Sun Jammer, 17 months, Sun Jammer. Now he says this. Now, Irish rep skill you in. <laughs> you have split to um above all do. A touch of a doing do. <laughs> Brilliant. You can read it and know what it is. I love that. Sun Jammer, good to see you, mate. And thank you very, very much indeed. Um, this URL not found. You're very welcome in. He says, it's a holiday in the States, so I can watch you live. You won't regret a minute of it. Until, you know, you regret everything. It's great to see you, man. Hope all is well. And uh, let me see. Zybok. God almighty, all the subs tonight. Zybok Doc has subscribed. No, he hasn't, but he subscribed. <laughs> subscribed. Subscribed at Prime for 19 months. Thank you very, very much indeed, my guy. God almighty. One alert is bad enough. Who are you telling? Uh, but yes, now let me see. We're catching up. Uh, where, where, what? Your head bobbing up. What's going on? Uh, canoe Head. You're very welcome aboard, Canoe Head. Uh, let me see. Hey, Matt is here. Good to see you, Matt. Paladin. Happy Monday to you, my dude. Hope all is well. Uh, let me see now. We're catching up. 
I see some community members uh, are all spooled up. Ooh, nice. Yeah, we'll be getting going here now shortly. Uh, Thub42, good to see you. Does someone only get him the R volume of the Encyclopedia Britannica? Do you remember the old encyclopedias in your house? In a book? Well, many books. Do you remember those? Every house had them. They were sold to... Here's me volume. They were sold to people, right? And basically the sales pitch was... If you want to look intelligent when your neighbours come around, you need this. If you don't have it, they'll think you're stupid. So people went off and spent loads of money buying this massive collection of encyclopedia. And then we had to read them. But let's be honest about it, lads. And that's is when we used to have all these encyclopedias, sure, you'd look at the pictures, but then you'd make forts, you know, or platforms to put other stuff on when you stack them all together. Right? It's, it's, it's science, science. Uh, Andy Brown, good to see you. Now, where are we at? We're over here. Uh, Captain Gaiman, he says, well, that looks like a pretty plane. It's a pretty plane. So Captain Gaiman, for anyone who doesn't know, a real life pilot, he went from zero to real life pilot in a record time. Like record, within a, a matter of months. And he now flies the Pilatus PC-12 out in the Caribbean or indeed the Caribbean. Uh, including some famous airports, such as St. Bart's. Right, Trading Places. Do you remember they used to do that show, Trading Places? I nearly said something else there, but you know what I mean? Just swap one life for the other. Notice I said life with a W. Oh no, with an L. Oh no! Right, anyway. um, Look at him reading. Oh, there's Gibbo again. Come on, Gibbo. Great to see you, man. Don't worry, I won't mention... Oh, no, I will. Tonight is the big one now for the Roman history stuff. So it's fine. Um, Gassius Maximus, you're very welcome aboard. Good to see you. Lee Dixon, welcome in. Eagle Castella, welcome aboard. Cold Nebo, thank you very much indeed for the bits. Then Old Veteran 965, like a devil, gifting five tier one subs to our viewers here on Twitch. Thank you very, very much indeed, Scott. Incredible generosity. And guys, if you did receive a tier one subscription from Old Veteran, well, do be sure to say thank you. Or go rev me, Liam Mahogoth. Or dad, ah, Jays is brilliant. You know, um, in you know, whatever way you can. Uh, Scorpio says, did you park the old Skoda in Luton Airport? Multi-story. <laughs> no. <laughs> Was there a fire? Was there a fire? Jesus. Uh, Cold Nebo, good to see you. Hayden UK is here. Welcome aboard. Now, have an amazing stream and flight, says Eagle Castilla. And you too. Well, have an amazing day. Have an amazing day. The Garlic Wars. Do I need a uh, oh, mint? Yes, a couple of mints. Uh, but yes, now, Soccer Pilot, yes. Jamie Paradox, hello there. Good to see you. You might fly today. Brilliant. John DFW, good to see you, man. Uh, let me see here now. We're catching up. Kingsman9965, all the way from Liverpool. It's great to see you, man. How is she cutting? Uh, Keith of Farrell is here. He says, hi, Murph, and Mrs. Two-Tone, and all. Hope is well. I hope all is well. All is well. Great to see you, man. QC Frank is here. He says, Murph, was going to stream yesterday, ended up with a three-hour outage. Oh, no way, man. Bad Dog is here. He says, hello, my dude. Lovely to see you. He's a great dog. Really great dog. It's great to see you, Bad Dog, Richard. Happy Monday, man. Captain Meowington says, I really want to take the cow's DA42 out for a spin tonight. I hope I'll be able to keep up. Well, maybe. What do you get out of the, the DA42? About 150, maybe? Give or take. Uh, Adoran, good to see you. Welcome in. Welcome in. Uh, tabletop Android. Hello, hello. Great to see you, man. Kaharia, the lovely Kaharia. Great to see you, Kaharia. Um, Kaharia was drinking grape juice. Oh, no, she wasn't. That was Campat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was Campat was drinking it. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Uh, Gabe is over on YouTube as well. We also have Iron Knob Airways. Welcome in, everybody. Thank you also very, very much indeed. You see, I have two screens to see. Highly sophisticated. Uh, Helder Martins. Good to see you, man. Good evening. Who else is here? Randy Godwin. Hello, Randy. Hope you're keeping well, man. Uh, and if I've missed anyone, we'll just start shouting quite loud. You see, quite loud. I'm on the last leg of... F uh, oh, wait, no. This URL says... I'm on the last leg of San Francisco to New York City flight with the DA-42. It's an incredible bird. Nice. Yeah, Muse fan, I had a CTD as well. And also, Muse fan, happy Monday. Good to see you, man. Um, now, let me see. Where are we at? We're over here, look. Did the Romans have pelicans? Sure, sure, sure. They called them uh, e pelicanae. 
Maximus, uh, something like that, you know. But yes, now, where are we at? We're over here. Restoring two to six, 33 months. Thank you very, very much indeed, my guy. Cheers. God almighty, the support tonight. Dragon, 617. Happy Monday. Uh, now, let me see. WM Flight Sim on a three-stream streak, no less. Thank you very much. Harrier 1956, good to see you. You're welcome aboard. Uh, Viper, or no, he didn't. Old veteran, a second time, a second time. Another five tier one subs, lads. Yeah, what? Thank you very, very much indeed, old veteran. God almighty, lads. It, just, there's lots of you now. Be sure to thank uh, old veteran 965. That's incredible support. Thank you very, very much indeed. Uh, now, let me see. Hayden, good to see you. Uh, incredible support, isn't it? Nuts. Uh, now, let me see. Mr. Nickfire. Hello. Good to see you. Uh, let me see. Who's... Is it... Uh, oh, Jesus. Is it R. McKay? No? Uh, you see, I'm going to pronounce names terribly. I always do that. But I'll try my best. Coco Flanell is here. Good to see you. Keyboard chat. Welcome aboard. And, uh, well, anyone who've missed... Welcome in, lads. Welcome in. There's Muse fan. Good to see you. He says... Hey, come on. You're going a bit mad there. He's, <laughs> he says, how he is just my jokes. Uh, basically, good evening. Good evening. Do you know... Uh, we need to have President's Day here too for good old. Yeah, baby. Yeah. Michael de Higgins. I just like to say to the Irish people that today we will celebrate President's Day. It's Michelle. No, wait. It's Michelle. A Michael de I have a Michael de Higgins somewhere. Where did he go? So, me, me aunt. Is it? Yeah, me aunt. Right. Where has she got the. I'm telling you. Now, it's either a tea cosy or it's a puppet. It's Mr. Mick the Higgins. Tell me, Michael, President's Day. Oh, it is a puppet. Oh, no, it's a tea cosy. It's an actual tea cosy. Look, the spout goes. In. Oh, no. What are they called? The handle goes on that side and the spout goes on this side. I know all about teapots. Right? That, that's Mick the Higgins. Brilliant. Anyway, the things you find in your room. Uh, who else is here before, you know, I get myself in trouble? Uh, let me see. <laughs> uh, Microsoft, oh wait, Microsoft Encarta, oh my god, do you remember Encarta? It used to come on a CD-ROM, <gasps> and they had the videos, remember? You'd watch the zebras, right? Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. God almighty, that's it, that's a memory right there, this URL, huh? Microsoft Encarta, that's made me day. Right, brilliant. Uh, anyway, uh, 67, is it Guapo? V welcome in, man. Good to see you. Uh, now, let me see. Electric, uh, or Electric Streams. It's okay if I ask a question about the Roman Empire. Is this the right stream to ask? Indeed it is. Encarta was absolutely legend, you know. Uh, you said, sure, would you look at the pictures? The same way Tommy Tiernan said, sure, you'd look for the fire. <laughs> sure, you'd look at the pictures. Yes, it was. Is that my phone? <laughs> Muse fan, we must watch the same comedy things as, you know. Uh, Eagle Airways, very good evening to you. Happy Monday, man. Aviator Geek is here. Good to see you. Lads, it's kind of busy, but we're getting there. And my throat is very sore. But we'll get there, right? We'll get there. Uh, a, de a defective Skoda. What? Don't be saying things like that. There's no such a thing. Defective Skoda. Crazy. Uh, right, now, where we see? Uh, we're over here, look. CTD loading in. I had one as well. So did Rambog Mord. Uh, Englewood Online. Very good evening to you, man. Good to see you. Uh, been getting loads of CTDs loading in since the Dune update. I didn't even install it. Yep. Uh, I, I'm right there with you, man. Now, yeah, we're catching up here. Look. God almighty. God almighty. Kingsman uh, gifted five tier one subs. You absolute ledge, man. Thank you very, very much indeed. And lads, if you got a gifted tier one sub by Kingsman, well, do be sure to say uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, now, let me see. Murph, uh, I may have said this before, but I love your new camera, posi camera position. It's great. Well, thank you very much. Every now and again, certain things come into the frame when they shouldn't. But it's, it's grand. I didn't look at that. So that's where the... Right? Anyone who, who uses, like, cameras or, like, CCTV, I found the blind spot. And that's where you hide all your stuff. Now, I can't hide too much stuff here. As you'll see, is it this camera? Pow. That's it there. So, <laughs> what you can see is Milk of the Higgins, uh, the box with me sextant, and me kind of monster, and cameras and stuff. Very sophisticated setup here, lads. Oh, can you see? Can you read the writing on the. Ha, keep an eye on the prompter there, look. Can you see that? 
There's a prize now if someone can read what I actually have on my prompter. Do you see the writing on the screen? Look, it's over there. Look, do you see it? Isn't that like modern technology gone friggin' mad, lads? <laughs> mad. Oh, wait, I'm actually making a balls of it. Hang on. Pull the big switch, good buddy. It's all happening now, lads. Empire Kicking has just raided us with a party of raiders. You're very welcome in, lads. Hope you had a fantastic stream. We're just about to get uh, flying here. We're departing out of, um, what's it called? Mannheim City. Uh, in a Pilatus PC-12. Looking forward to it. Uh, Lucas, good to see you. Who else is here? It's Flights with Joel. Joel, it's great to see you, man. I hope you're well. Subscribing to the channel with Prime, 23 months, Joel. Thank you very, very much indeed. Joel, will you be going to Vegas? Tis a question. Uh, those were the days in Carta. They were brilliant. They were absolutely brilliant. Eagle Airways has subscribed for 13 months. Aaron, thank you very, very much indeed. Thank you uh, for the support. Uh, in Carta, the encyclopedia which classified Romeo and Juliet as comedy for three editions straight. Having said that, I spent so much time browsing in Carta. Right? That's a big ten for good buddy. Did they say Romeo and Juliet was a comedy? Well, it kind of was, and, you know, until it wasn't. You know, you said effective ring, Murph. No such thing as effective Skoda. Listen, they were talking about defects. Doesn't happen. You want tent? Wait, what? Uh, right. Do I see there a bald spot? No, it, it's the reflection from very powerful lights, Kaharia. Yes, yes, it's very powerful lights. Yes, yes, right. The setup looks amazing. Thank you very much indeed. It took ages, didn't it? It took ages, but sure, we all had a part in this. Then Gibbo came down and I broke a computer and we had some beers and we talked about life for a while. And then we kind of, you know what I mean? He called me an idiot. Like, I wouldn't mind... Before all of this, Gibbo came down, he was like, and I was saying, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of remodel the place, tidy it up. And he goes, oh, yeah, great idea. And I did, right? And he came down, like, and we're here having a beer and he's like, you should really put that over there and put this over there. And I was like, why didn't I think of that? So a couple of months later, I was like, right, Gibbo, remember what? Anyway, so that's kind of, and I've added to it, do you know, and a real message now, and I'm not just saying this, you know, for the comedic value, but about 10 minutes before the stream, I was putting some seven up into my cup on, in which I have some dingle gin, right? I mix it with seven up. And whatever way I went to move, I have a carpet here underneath me. And I didn't put enough pressure and not enough weight. And you're probably saying, well, I didn't put enough weight on my right foot. And I went to move it. And of course, what happens when you try to move? So it shot forward, right? And I'm wearing socks. I've no shoes on. They're just socks. They're not even full socks. They're more of a, so right? They're not full length, look. Look, ankle's there, right? Uh, but anyway, whatever move I made, my foot went at high velocity, ramming speed, straight in to the Ikea cabinet. And I bashed me toes. And it wasn't like, oh no, ha, oh God, I'm just after bashing me. No, God, no, Jesus, no. I almost wept. I almost wept. But I'm all right now. You know, they're still there. You know, me toes. Uh, but anyway... Uh, Cy Murray, thank you very much indeed. 31 months. God almighty. That's in incredible support, lads, tonight. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, now, let me see. Yes, uh, but when we... Oh, wait. Yes, but then we can't talk about it, says Joel. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. We'll go to Vegas, but then we can't say anything. I can imagine it now. The stream just after Vegas. Welcome, uh, like to welcome everybody back. Had a great week in Vegas. Moving on. Uh, right, something like that, something like that. Uh, right, now, where are we at now? Uh, Sterling, good to see you. Uh, used to use the family encyclopedia to do school reports. They were useful. Right, absolutely. whack a -mo, happy Monday. The hair just gets rubbed off when he beats his head against the wall. <laughs> what? what did you? Fine. Uh, the moment you learned, the moment you learned 14 languages, pretty much, you invent your own, in fact, you know. Uh, now, let me see. Where are we at? We're over here. Uh, shot out. It did. It shot out. Brilliant. Uh, is there a new venue for the con? They're going to have it in, I think, the Rio in Las Vegas. Uh, the Rio. Uh, I may have to follow Murph around with the camera at the ready to tape everything for later use. <laughs> It'd be grand, right? It'd be brilliant. Uh, Viper posted some info where Expo might be held. Yeah, I think they're going to go with the Rio. They're going to chance at them this week. You know, Murph yelped out unspeakable language of profanity. Only the way Murph knows. Yes, yes, yes. There was a lot of ve uh, verbs or doing words in it. Do you know what I mean? But yes, uh, Ippy Vegas was great when the court case, yes, yes. Then the court case would happen. Yes. 
I see what you did there. The Rio, looking forward to it. Might hear more tonight. Yeah, I think they're chatting to him today, lads. Do you know? Now, I need to do something very... Uh, um, um, what's the word? Sophisticated. And move my camera and then adjust my microphone. Until we come over to here, look. Right? Welcome in. Great to see everyone. And uh, we're going to get ourselves jonesed up for a flight. We're here in the Pilatus PC-12. The excellent rendition. The legacy version from Simworks Studios. And... Uh, well, you gotta love this thing, right? It's it's so very, very close to the real world aircraft. It's frightening considering the amount of work and feedback the team got, not only not only from real world pilots, but they got to work with the guys on the real world simulators and technical data and stuff that just makes you want to sit down because it's awesome. So I said we'll fly it, right? So I want to show you some of this before we get going because on our flight plan this evening, I don't believe I added in uh one of the waypoints but anyway we're following this one this is the flight plan published and we'll see how we get on right so i just wanted to have a look at the weather so we're on the ground here in Mannheim, and we're going to be flying straight up and across and we're using live weather tonight so there's going to be some cloud and some rain as well we can see that some heavy showers along the way so uh we'll see how we get on and hopefully all will be well right just wait for the next update i cannot wait for it man i cannot wait so uh, the Shadow Expo in the Janet Air Terminal. Could you imagine? Uh, Lior Taylor, hello, welcome in. Good to see you, Medic uh, 2 for Life, or is it Medic 24 Life? Real men cry. <laughs> the, 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 well, I cried. Do you know? Uh, Davis Ebert, hello, David. Good to see you. Uh, Swed Sim Aviator, you're very welcome in. And to everyone on YouTube, lads, you're very welcome aboard. Thank you indeed for uh, rambling over. Do be sure to hit the little like button. It helps out a lot, do you know? And uh, who else is here? Uh, Gary Duggan, good to see you. Good morning to you, man. Uh, he invaded in summer, so I compromised him out with a spring weather setting. Well, funny enough, he actually, uh, he actually invaded in late summer very close towards the end of the campaigning season, which was odd, right? So our last flight had us here in Mannheim, a beautiful part of Germany, right beside the River Rhine. And uh, there's actually photogrammetry here. It's a beautiful location to fly over. Our flight today, as I said, we're going to blast off from Mannheim and our first stop is over to Brussels. Then it's over to Calais Dunkirk and then we're on up into Britain. And we're going to be checking out Biggin Hill mainly. I was going to ramble over to Elstree. We'll see how we get on, but definitely London's Luton is our final destination for tonight, right? So it's all happening now. So uh, that's our flight plan. Go ahead and park that. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, well, what I'm going to do now, I do have a spreadsheet, or a spreadsheet, a check sheet. This is the check sheet from Captain Gaiman, and I've made this available in our Discord. So we can see we have our pre-flight, before start, engine start, after start, before taxi, taxi, our final items, after takeoff, cruise, descent, approach, you name it, it's all there. And this fits perfectly with the SWS PC-12. So we're going to have a look at this as we're getting through our stuff, because you know what I'm like, right? Sometimes I follow it, sometimes I don't. So we're going to reset our view, jump here into the cockpit and say, be the Janie. Uh, well, we have all our covers on, so we're going to remove all of these. So remove the before flight, and we're just going to pop the L cover in there. Bring up the handle here as well. Um, now, let me see. We're going to fix our window blinds. Yep, you devil it. Uh, nearly out of the way. And bring you up out of the way. I think we're good now. Yeah, we're good. All right, okay. So a couple of things we need to check before we get going. So we need to make sure that the parking brake is set. And we need to make sure then that the landing gear is in the down position. Okay, we're looking good. We're looking good. Now we do have some shutoff valves over here at the back. So we can have a look at uh, the fuel and also we have the um, the ECS uh, emergency switch as well. So all is looking good. Park and brake is set but over there. My head is probably blocking it. That's it just in there, right? Uh, now let me see. So we're going to make sure that our condition lever is set to cut off. Our throttle is in idle. Uh, we have beta range in this as well. Flaps are set up. That's all okay. Oxygen. Uh, well, we can go kind of through this now shortly. So crew seatbelts, they're okay. Overhead electrical switches are off. Our standby bus goes to on. Some beautiful sounds here as well, right? Ascari Wolf, it's good to see you. Uh, so standby bus is on. The icing switches, we're going to go inertial separator to open. Uh, cooling and heating as required. Seatbelts, no smoking sign as required. Go ahead and put them on. Circuit breakers, ensure that they're all in. These are all modelled, lads. 
So we want to make sure that there's nothing popped out looking at us. And uh, don't mind me as I move across to Paddy's position. Well, Paddy, how are we on this side? We're all looking good? Good. With the handle up here as well. Okay, EPS switch we're going to test and then arm it. So EPS is down here onto the main dash. So we're going to test. Battery test is on. And we're going to arm it. Good. Uh, ECS switch is in the off position. Currently in the off position. That's set. And we're going to have a look at our friction lock, um, our condition lever, battery switch, nav light, and external power. So battery switch, we'll go ahead and bring up battery one. And we'll bring our nav light on here as well. Sweet. Uh, external power not needed. Fuel quantity, we're going to check that. And then our cause, make sure that it is appropriate with no warnings. Okay, have a quick look here now. So pusher, we'll do our pusher test once we get the engine started. Uh, and everything over here is looking good. Sweet. So, uh, let me see. Beacon light is going to be turned on. That's our next little trick. So, beacon light to on. Uh, prop area is going to be clear. And uh, then we will engage the starter, right? So, let's have a look here now. Now, we do have a door open. We better close this devil. Where's the click spot for the door? There we go. And if I, if I remember correctly, I have the back door open as well. Do you know the way you'd have the back door open? Uh, Andy Brown is on Southeast Asia. I'll activate the old um, gadget here now in a moment. Oh, that's the light switch. Where's the uh, where's the door handle? You click on the door? I think you do. No. Oh. You click on the bottom door? I always forget where this is. Isn't there like a button for it? Uh. uh don't panic, Murphy. Isn't there a button for this? No? Am I raving? That's a light switch. There we go. Okay. I think it locks automatically, doesn't it? Pull tape for oxygen mask. Yeah, I think we're good. I think we're good. Don't have a working PC at the moment. Sean Dale, any word on that yet? No? <clears throat> Alright, okay. Essential bus is currently on. Battery is already on. Okay, we're looking alright here. So what we're going to do, uh, we're going to start putting some power into the aircraft. Battery 2 coming on, inertial separator is on, beacon light is already running, gens will look after that in a moment, uh, standby bus is on, our battery is already on, fuel pumps go into on, ignition will be set to auto, and then we're going to engage the starter, and once we have sufficient spin um, on our NG, we'll introduce our fuel into ground idle. How's that for a plan? So, start engage, prop is clear, we can open a little window here, and we'll go for start. Now we monitor. Pumps auto. Backseat drivers, you're more than welcome. Right, NG is looking good. Up you devil. Now we monitor for a hot start and a hung start, so ITT. Make sure she peaks. And we want to make sure our NG continues to rise as well. We have a good start. Okay, so ignition auto for the moment. Generator on. Generator two on. Uh, we can power up the avionics. And a standby bus switch. I'm almost certain can go to off. Let's have a look. Engine instruments, standby bus if applicable, off. Thank you. All right, so quick check on our systems. So ECS, we're going to engage that here now. Set to auto. We'll do our pusher test here in a moment. Let's just get our flight plan put in as well. Transponder goes to auto. Let's just double check temperatures and pressures. Fuel quantity is looking good. Do a quick test on this as well. All the animations, uh, they follow that of the um, of the real aircraft. Uh, starter, ignition, auto. There we go. Uh, cruising altitude for today. We're going to start at initial 4,500 feet. So we can dial that in while we're waiting, and we can also activate the flight director. Oh, that's waiting for the other thing. That's waiting for the autopilot to come on. All right, okay. Uh, right, let me see. So pusher, we'll worry about him in a moment. So we're going to go to our flight plan, and uh, I'm going to put in some information here of where we're going. So our overall destination is London's Luton Airport, and we'll have a couple of waypoints along the way. So our first one is Brussels, Echo Bravo Bravo Romeo. Uh, after Brussels, we're going to head over to Calais, Dunkirk. Uh, after that, then, it's over to England, and it's going to be that of Biggin Hill. 
Uh, Echo Golf Kilo Bravo, I think. Is it? Echo Golf Kilo Bravo, Big and Hill, a view. Uh, and then that's us. So click back, map, quick check, make sure she's looking all right. She's looking all right. That looks good for me. Now, while we're sitting here, we're going to make sure that our barrow is reset. Make sure our directional heading indicator is reset. Uh, CDI will go on to GPS. Uh, what else do I want to do here now? We want to go... Do, 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 do. What do I want to do here now? That's on VO War. We'll change that in a moment. Uh, I have some lighting down here. Panel lights and come on. The rest of it is fairly okay. Uh, we do have some environmental stuff. Uh, cabin, we're not going to go too high, so I'm not too worried about cabin altitude. Uh, oxygen comes on. We're going to drop our flaps down to 15 degrees, and we're going to do a pusher test. So, reappear the yoke. So, let me think now. How do we do a pusher test? Let's see. Pusher test is going to be... Bear with me now. I need to remember how to do this. Uh... Pusher test. So, push your enunciation on the... Yeah, that's okay. Uh, power control lever forward until the stick shaker engages and then move it back to idle. I think I need to hit the pusher up on top though, isn't it? There's the shake. Good stuff. Perfect. Click on the pusher button. Disengage up on top. Hang on, I didn't do that right. Easy now, Jemima. Push your test in. Now, push your interrupt. Enable that. Now we bring the yoke backwards. Shouldn't that pusher like come off? Hang on a second, hang on. Wait for the caution. Is that what we did? Don't forget the AP test. Yes. Uh, let's see here now. Starter, auto, not on. We have that. So we'll try this pusher test one more time. That's engaged. Right? Disengage the pusher. No, I think we're good. We're good. I disengaged it. Right, grand. We're laughing, lads. We're laughing. Uh, right, AOA on D-Ice. Angle of attack on D-Ice. I'll put the probes on. Will that sort that headache? It will. It will. Uh, so let me see now. For our autopilot, let's have a quick look. HSI. So if you go to heading mode, we're going to zero this into heading mode. And we're going to select heading mode. Uh, autopilot master switch. Where do we do that one again now? Let's have a quick look. Uh, that's good. That's good. That's good. Let's have a look. Um, if we do autopilot, test this devil first. Warning, autopilot trim. Okay, autopilot engage, heading mode. Now, if I turn this devil left, the yokes move left. Turn this guy to the right, the yokes move right. Zero to it. Controls to go back to zero should do. Here we go. And we can probably check out our vertical speed function here as well. Uh, let me see now. Indicated airspeed or soft ride. Let's have a look. Not that we'll put in. Uh, soft ride, half bank, back course approach, nav, indicated airspeed, up or down. Uh, v speed. It'll be in here, look. So if we go V speed 900. Engage. I'm not sure will that pull back though. Probably not. So that's in the arm position. Take off arm. Uh, four and a half thousand is set. And then autopilot. Hello there. We will disengage you. Why is that turning that way now? That's interesting, isn't it? Or maybe it's just going through the self test. You know. Probes and windshield. Well, we have our probes open. Uh. We can put those on as well. Uh, autopilot trim is okay. Autopilot off. 
controls are free and correct. Yaw dampener off. Okay. Now, my last little trick. What are we doing in here? We want to go to this on nav. Is going to be GPS. Uh, might keep it on an arc for the crack. Bring the range as it is. And I think we're looking good. So, up to the over top. Stab trim. It's in the downeth position. Bit of trimage up. Uh, you don't actually turn the AP on the ground, do you know? Grand! Uh, the GPS navigation system you have in the plane, is that coming from the plane or do you have to buy it separate? Um, so it's the, um, what should we call it? It is the PMS 50 GTN 750. I think you can get like a freeware version of it. But um, more times than not, uh, I think it's like, is it 30 bucks for the year? Something like that. Something like that. Now, why aren't you liking stab trim here, Julia? Uh, let's have a look here. There is a free version of it. Sweet. Uh, now, we stab trim. It's not liking that. We have a warning on it. Let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. That's stab trim up. Will that go up? Hang on now. It is moving it, but it's very slow. Interesting. There we go. I know the trim on this moves quite slow, but sure, listen, we won't worry about it too much. All right, okay, I think we're, I think we're good, lads. I think we're good. So uh, the meet our conditions here, or the uh, the runway in which she's going to favour a takeoff. Let's go in and have a look, right? So we're saying Manheim, and uh, let's have a look. So departure runway. Uh, let me see. It's going to be runway two seven. So that's just pretty much straight ahead and off to the right hand side, right? Let's see what happens. So parking brake coming off. I think it does work, Captain Gaiman. Sort of nearly. Small bit of power just being applied. Make sure our lights are working where they need to be. Uh, taxi lights are on. Strobes, not yet. Rico lights. I think we're looking good. We are looking good. What a beautiful airplane, isn't it? The Pilot is PC-12. It's an absolute stunner, this thing. Now, don't get lost, Murphy, whatever you do. Remember that time I nearly got lost? Easy now. Okay, we'll bring up some uh, multiplayer here now, guys. This should be fun. <laughs> this could be a lot of fun. Roger. Oh, there's everyone loading in. Good stuff. Now, when it comes to... Um, the Duty 7000 should be our squat code in VF4, shouldn't it? Should be. We're currently in standby. But it depends on the country, right? What happened with the thing you bought twice on Friday? I, I got a refund. I got a refund. Simbox, yeah. I'll have another look at that some other day, but at the moment, yeah. Uh, we'll go HSI here for a minute. Oh, there's a plane literally gone through us, and we're getting stutters, but let's see what happens. Now, what's awesome about the PC-12 is it's her takeoff... Can um, I do the refund? No, there's no refunds. It's his takeoff and landing capabilities. I mean, this thing can get you in and out of some very tight places. Jesus, there's a Vulcan here as well. What almighty... Right, lads, don't mind me here for the moment at all. Uh, but we need to get moving. You know what I mean? We need to get moving, boys. As I try to set up some sort of a view. That doesn't have a big gaping hole in the roof. There we go. Yes, we've got a huge selection of airplanes here with us tonight. So we're live on the Southeast Asian server. There's a DC-6 here? 
Incredible. Uh, don't forget to arm your altitude. For a moment there, I almost forgot. <laughs> Brilliant. Right, before we overshoot the runway, landing lights on, strobes on, transponder set to altitude report. And we got ourselves lined up here. Beautiful. It's quite busy, but let's see what happens. I mean, what's the worst that could happen, lads? Do you know what I mean? A lot could happen, Murph. Okay, so before get go, let's have a quick check, make sure everything is doing what it needs to do. My frame rate is getting an absolute bashing, but it's fine. GPS mode, GPS is set. Heading mode, sync it to runway heading. Uh, come down here, you devil. Thank you. Uh, nav mode should be armed. It isn't. Nav mode armed. So on takeoff, we can activate all this jazz here as well. Uh, we should be handy climbing at around 1500 feet per minute. Okay, so. God almighty, planes flying through you. Uh, we're going to go into flight idle. There we go. The frame rate has taken an absolute bashing on the ground, but don't worry, once we get airborne, we'll be set. Okay, we're looking good. We're walking, talking, and we're squawking. Brakes off. Power coming in. Am I gonna outrun a Vulcan? That's the question. Don't mind the fact that we've just flown in through loads of people. Okay, airspeed live. The needle is moving. 80 knots. Easy Betsy, easy Betsy. Jesus, catches me every time. Yup, you devil you. Positive rate, gear up. Easy. Right, we're alive. Just. We left an awful lot of runway back there. Left an awful lot of rubber on the runway back there. It's grand. Okay, keep an eye on those temperatures. Speed is looking somewhat healthy. Flaps are in. Yeah, damn fun. I'm having a bit of bother with the trimmage. She's very slow coming up. I'll give it a few moments, though. So far, so good. I'm holding about 1,500 feet on our own climb. There's Jamie Paradox in the orange topter thing. <laughs> Jamie, I'd love to say I have it installed, but I really don't. <laughs> right, okay, so autopilot. Talk to me, Goose. Critical speed set to 1500. Nav mode is engaged. And we shall be on our merry little way. We hope, lads. We hope. It's, it's, so this plane, right? This thing handles so differently than anything else in the sim, I found. Because it features, uh, as it does in the real world, the rudder is connected to your yoke. The whole thing is interconnected, right? So when you try and, you know, handle the aircraft, it takes a bit of thinking. However, if you give yourself the challenge that I just gave myself, having a low frame rate, it doesn't act really well because by the time you realize what's wrong to counter that, you're over emphasizing on that correction. If that makes sense. Do you know what I mean? Man who was having the same issue with the trim. Yeah, I, it's just very slow to react, do you know? Now, we did put in four and a half thousand feet for our initial altitude, and we should be grand with that. We just zoom out here for a moment. All is looking good here, lads. Uh, there's everyone behind us. So let's just do a quick check here before we can kind of calm everything down. So speed is looking good. Temperatures and pressures are looking good. 93%, we should be good. Uh, engines are right. Generators are doing what they need to do. Nothing given out to us. Everything up here is looking good. Uh, inertia separator, we'll leave it on for the moment. Okay, we've reached our cruise altitude for the moment. Watch our power. Dial her back a little bit. 200 indicated is ideal, but, you know, we'll slow it down a little bit, right? Uh, reset fuel. Fuel reset? Is it reset? 
Is that for fuel used, Captain Gaiman? 36.9, it says zero. Why is that fuel used zero? Uh. Uh. Grant! We don't need fuel. Where we're going, we don't need fuel. Like, my fuel quantity is in here, right? And it's 2155, but it says used zero. Uh, 36.9 into our torque. 30, yeah, but I'm going to be going too fast. We'll keep it handy for the minute. Because otherwise we're going to get up to about 220. What's the fastest you got out of your PC-12? Officially and, you know, <clears throat> unofficially. <laughs> Brilliant. Right, what we're going to do, lads, as we're flying along, well, if you're on the Xbox, press 1. If you're on the PC, press 2. And if you're here because it's Monday and we're off to an adventure early on, well, you press number 3. Dude, have you been drinking? I have, Ted. I've been drinking like a mad idiot. Hello, Fireflies. Welcome to the Flying Circus. We live stream every Monday, Wednesday and Friday. 19, no it's not, 20 hundred Zulu time. Right here. Hello there. All right, all right, all right. So we have 30 on the PC, three on console. Thank you, Super Ty. Right, we're moving. So you're saying press and hold the button to reset the fuel. We're pressing, we're pressing, we're pressing. It's not showing me any used fuel. That's a good one, isn't it? Up to Brussels. Let's, let's, let's get some tasty beer. Indeed. Uh, right, yeah, frame rate is still getting a bit of a bashing, but uh, yeah, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. We're good on fuel now, even though we're not showing used fuel, no? Oh, I know what that is. Hang on, lads, I need to immediately pause the sim and then unpause it in a moment. Oh, wait, I wonder if I could do this true uh, uh, flow. Hang on. Add fuel, no. Uh, what's the option for fuel? No, we gotta go into the menu. Balls. Right, lads, hang on. Quick pause. Uh, assistance? Failure and damage. Crash engine. No, aircraft systems. Unlimited fuel. Turn that divil off. Do you know why I had that on? Testing out the other thing. Can I do it from in here? Unlimited. Unlimited fuel. No, we can only add fuel. Alright, okay. Now it's working grand. <laughs> Murphy, you're some sort of a genius. I mean, a special genius, you know. Uh, local time set in the sim is 10.15. Quarter past 10, that's. Uh, but yes, Angry Lou, it's good to see you. That's in pounds, by the way. Right, right. Some sort of strange numerical system. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, speaking of strange numerical systems, where's my notes? It's over here. Right, so, lads. Time for some room and chattery, right? 
So um, bear with me now on this, but you know, we're learning. Someone keep an eye on what's happening in the plane. You're in charge, I'll do some reading. So during his campaigns in the Gallic Wars, Julius Caesar led two expeditions in Britain, two of them. One in 55 BC and then one in 54 BC. On his initial attempt, Caesar brought along just two legions and he managed to only make a landing on the Kentish coast without any real significant territorial gains. The follow-up invasion was on a much grander scale, involving some 800 ships, 5 legions and 2,000 cavalry units. This formidable force went unchallenged upon landing, as the Britons opted to wait until Caesar's forces moved inland before engaging them. Uh, or engaging them. Uh, on his second incursion, Caesar's forces advanced into Middlesex and then crossed the Thames, compelling the British chieftain to submit to Rome's demands, including tribute. Caesar also put a client king, furthering Romans' influence in the region, and despite these achievements, the Romans withdrew to Gaul, having not secured any permanent territory. Caesar's narratives of these invasions, in our commentaries of the Gallic Wars, provide the earliest detailed eyewitness accounts of Britain's inhabitants, culture, and its landscape. Hello there. I'm getting double alerts. Uh, marking the commencement of Britain's recorded history, or at the very least, it's pro-history, right? I need to fix the alerts here, lads. Just bear with me. Let's see if that works now. They were coming through in the double, but many thanks for the follow! Uh, Peter Griffin. <laughs> Peter. <laughs> That's a great name, Peter Griffin. I love it. Uh, Stewie, how are you? Uh, but anyway, the story. Prior to Caesar's expeditions, Britain was somewhat of an enigma to the classical world recognised mainly for its tin resources. The coastline had been charted by a Greek, exp uh, a Greek explorer, uh, Pythias, in the 4th century BC, and possibly even earlier than that... Can I get a refund? ...by the Carthaginian sailor, uh, Himilco, right? Uh, and that was in the 5th century BC. However, for many Romans, Britain was shrouded in mystery, positioned at the very edge of the known world, and some even doubted its existence regarding the Greek accounts as a fabrication, right? The Romans didn't even know you were here. By the time Julius Caesar rambled over, Britain was immersed in the late pre-Roman Iron Age, with a population estimated between somewhere between kind of one and four million, while archaeological findings suggest a contrast in its uh, economy between the fertile lowlands of the southeast, conductive to extensive arable farming, and the more challenging highlands where uh, farming pretty much prevailed, pastoralism prevailed. The Southwest enjoyed developed communication networks along established trackways and navigable rivers like the Thames, indicating a growing significance in trade. Settlements typically situated on elevated terrain and fortified began emerging in lower areas, particularly near the river crossings, hinting at the increasing importance of commerce. The Roman conquest of Transalpine Gaul in 124 BC notably enhanced commercial interactions between Britain and the continent, with Italian wine imports uh, being the key indicator of this massive trade route. Now, let me see. What happened? Someone still think that now. Um, Caesar's accounts reveal that northeastern Gaul's Belgae a previously raided Britain, even establishing settlements along its coast. He notes that a Belgic king had exerted influence in Britain and Gaul within recent memory. The coinage of this era in Britain reflects a complex pattern of external influence. The early Gallo-Belgic coins minted in Gaul from as early as 150 BC, predominantly discovered in Kent. Subsequent coinage minted, minted in Britain suggests that the Belgic influence extended westward along the south coast and inland, possibly through political domination over indigenous populations by Belgic chieftains. Now, we're going to learn quite a bit uh, about all this stuff here tonight, lads, so you'll have to just bear with me, right? Because uh, I, I wrote an awful lot of notes here, because this, this part of history fascinates me, right? Did the Romans eat pizza? They could have. What have I stumbled into? Did Murphy partner with the History Channel? This is our... Um, um, Encarta. Encarta. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the free version of Encarta, lads. 
Look at the state of that, though. Look at the state of that with live weather and everything. Oh, Jesus, is beautiful. Anyway, I'll continue. You just sit back there and think of our, uh, Rome. Just think of Rome, right? Um, the motivation behind Caesar's invasion. Why? Right? We ask ourselves, well, why? Context from the Gallic Wars. But Julius Caesar's campaign to conquer Gaul, which began in 58 BC, well, it saw significant progress by 56 BC, particularly with his victory over the Veneti, or the Veneti, notable naval battle securing most of the northwest of Gaul. Two episodes ago, we rambled up to Brittany, where uh, the Romans defeated the Veneti uh, up that neck of the woods, right? Caesar justified his invasions of Britain on several grounds. He claimed that Britain had historically supported the Gauls' resistance against Rome, providing refuge for fugitives from the Gallic Belgae and aided the Veneti, who in turn sought British assistance in their 56 BC rebellion against the Roman forces. Strabo further indicates that the Venetic uprising aimed to obstruct Caesar's potential disruption of their trade routes to Britain hinted at the strategic importance of Caesar's British expedition. Right? Beyond the immediate military motivations, Caesar's interest in Britain was also driven by its economic and mineral wealth. The expedition was possibly a means to evaluate Britain's resources, with Cicero later explaining and expressing disappointment over the absence of gold or silver on the island. Suetonius adds a layer of personal ambition to Caesar's motive, suggesting he sought pearls during his British ventures. Caesar had a thing for pearls. He friggin' loved them, right? If there was one thing Gaius Julius Caesar loved, it was pearls. You know, and war and stuff, right? But anyway, the motivations behind this invasion, well, they were multifaceted, blending strategic military objectives, economic exploration, not to mention the political ambitions. Caesar conquers the known world, and it has a great ring to it, considering the Romans, some of them didn't even believe this land even existed. It's this edge of the world type of stuff. Imagine Caesar, the first Roman ever to set foot in Britain. Pretty cool, right? Pretty cool. So we're going to move on to the first invasion. Then we've more to chat about, but we'll cover this bit and then we'll take a moment to reflect, right? Uh, there'll be questions later. You better write this stuff down. <clears throat> the first invasion, uh, we're going to focus here on the 55th or 55 BC, which is kind of in our timeline of leaving Germany, heading across through Belgium and then across the Channel for the first time. The first Roman invasion of Britain in 55 BC marked a pivotal moment in Caesar's Gallic Wars, expanding the theatre of conflict to the British Isles. This section of the campaign followed the successful subjugation of northwest France, leaving only south central France outside of Roman control. In preparation for the invasion, Caesar sought intelligence from merchants familiar with Britain, but he found them reluctant to share this information, likely to protect their lucrative trade secrets. Consequently, he dispatched his officers on a reconnaissance mission to survey the Kentish coast. He came across a place then called Dubris, or Dover, which appeared to be the best landing area. Despite this, um, the officers returned after five days with limited intelligence. Simultaneously, emissaries from several British tribes, having been alerted to Caesar's officers, rambled over to offer their submission. He saw something similar than what he had in Gaul. There would be some of these Britain tribes looking to get one up on their rivals and they saw the Roman invasion or at least the presence of Romans as a great opportunity. Hence they reached out and said how are you right? Um, now where are we at over here? Caesar amassed a fleet of 80 transport ships. He would have had these from the battle with the Veneti. They were designed to transport two legions Legio 7 and Legio 10 the 7th and 10th Legion, alongside an unspecified number of warships under the command of a quaestor. This fleet was assembled at a port within Marini territory, likely at Portus Itus, modern-day St. Omer, and additionally, 18 transport ships designated for cavalry were prepared at a different location. 
The design of these ships remains subject to speculation. They could have been modelled on the Roman, even Venetic, or even tribal designs. Some of them might have been requisitioned directly from the Gallic communities. Despite being late in the season, which traditionally signalled the end of military campaigning, Caesar embarked for Britain in the late summer of 55 BC. The decision underscored Caesar's determination to extend Roman influence, driven by strategic, political and his personal motivations. The initial invasion, while not achieving substantial territorial gains, laid the groundwork for future Roman endeavours. It marked the beginning of a new chapter in both the island's history and that of Rome. In a rush to make landfall, Caesar left a garrison at the port and embarked on a nighttime march with his legions on August 23rd, aiming for a dawn arrival. The cavalry were instructed to follow by sea as swiftly as possible. This departure without cavalry and the fact that the legions were without their usual baggage or heavy siege equipment might suggest that Caesar's invasion was more of a demonstration of power than an intent for full conquest. Upon nearing the British shores, Caesar encountered a formidable sight. Britons, amassed on the hills, presenting a significant deterrent to the, choosing land, or the chosen landing site. The Britons painted themselves in blue. They were physically bigger than the Romans. They were hairy. They had tattoos. They were a mad bunch of lads. Um, Caesar held his position at anchor until the afternoon, waiting for additional supply ships and then conducted a war council before directing the fleet towards a more suitable landing spot. Again, the Britons mirrored the Romans' fleet movements along the coast, assembling a large force that included both cavalry and chariots. The Romans had never faced chariots before. The Roman soldiers faced a daunting challenge as they disembarked. The ships weighed down by the cargo, but they couldn't approach close to the shore, forcing the troops to wade through deep water under attack from the Britons. Not to mention, they had to carry all of their fighting armour, all their resupply, all their weapons. It took the flag bearer of the mighty 13th Legion to pick it up and charge forward. One of these sayings, it's, it's somewhat lost in kind of contextual sense, but Caesar said it, but it roughly kind of translates into, you know, at least, this is what the flag bearer said, at least I will die knowing that I have done well for, my, uh, for Rome and for my commander rather than just waiting in the ships. And it was an inspirational thing, do you know what I mean? So, uh, well, that's what he did, right? That's what he did. Anyway, the, where is it now? Uh, da, 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 da. Despite several attempts, the Roman cavalry auxiliaries failed to cross over to Britain, leaving Caesar without the mounted forces necessary to pursue the retreating Britons effectively. The beachhead. Recent archaeological investigations have pinpointed Ebb's fleet in Pegwell Bay as the probable site of Caesar's initial landing. The discovery of artefacts and substantial earthworks from this era supports the theory that Caesar's fleet, which was considerable in size, may have spanned several miles along the coast. So Caesar established his beachhead. After a hard day's fighting again, he had to suddenly react to this kind of Britain chariot movements. They never had to deal with this before. So Caesar, being the half genius that he was but the Romans did get their upper hand don't forget the Romans fought with some sort of mechanical mythology there was no end to what they were able to do they just went on and on and on and on and uh, well the Britons never seen anything like this before even at that well the Britons similar to what it was like in Gaul there were many different tribes there was no one single cohort of a consolidation of one entity. They were dealing with many, many different tribes. So Caesar, as he always did, he tried to pick them off one by one. So the Romans quickly fortified their position, established uh, their beachhead and a camp to play host to the British ambassadors who were rambling over. The Roman campaign faced significant challenges when a storm scattered the incoming cavalry reinforcements, driving them back to Gaul. Then another storm came in, which damaged all the warships and transports. The calamity not only jeopardised the Romans' return, but it also emboldened the Britons to renew their offensive, hoping to trap Caesar and his legions. The Britons, uh, the Britons launched an ambush uh, on a Roman foraging party, which led to a series of skirmishes. 
But despite these initial setbacks, the Romans, bolstered by makeshift cavalry forces, rallied by Commius, and employing scorched earth tactics, managed to rebel the Britons' renewed attacks. Again, the Romans at this stage, they were absolutely, um, they were veterans at this stage. I mean, these lads had already done battle and they faced some of the most fiercest Gallic tribes all throughout Gaul. Starting off at the very beginning, you know, they had the lads in Switzerland, Belgium, France, right? They, they fought against some serious guys. As the campaign season drew to a close with the Roman fleet in disrepair, Caesar opted to, repeat, uh, to retreat across the channel, utilising whatever ships could be salvaged. This, the, this decision marked the end of Caesar's first foray into Britain, setting the stage for his return the following year. But it wasn't without fail. Caesar sent all these stories back to Rome. He said to the British tribes, right, send me over, you know, um, slaves and, you know, gold and stuff. Yeah, we'll get right on that. I think one or two tribes did, but the rest of them were like, right. The Britons seem more to be just kind of entertaining these Romans. And who are these guys? Do you know? But by the time Caesar got back to Gaul and he sent his stories south to Rome itself, the people went into a friggin' frenzy. This Caesar fella, he's off gallivanting. He's just after invading Britain. Imagine that. Incredible stuff. Pompey wasn't terribly happy about the growing popularity of Caesar couple of chinks in the armour were starting to set in. So Caesar's campaign in Britain, while yielding no territorial conquests, it was a precarious yet strategic endeavour. Despite the logistical and tactical shortcomings of launching an expedition to an unknown territory with limited resources, Caesar averted a potential military disaster. The venture, although risky, secured Caesar a significant propaganda triumph, immortalised in the Gallic Wars, or the commentary of the Gallic Wars. These accounts, likely embellished, served not only to inform Rome of his deeds, but to enhance his stature within the Republic. His return was met with acclaim, culminating an extraordinary 20-day Thanksgiving celebration, cementing his historic status in Rome and furthering his political ambitions. Absolutely nuts, lads. Do you know what I mean? So that's the uh, that's the end of the part one. Next up, we're going to learn about the second invasion, right? Uh, then the aftermath, and then the discoveries that were made about this ancient Britain. Who were they? What were they? What insights do we have? Their military uh, techniques. What naval craft do they have? Their religious, economic, all that Hello information, there. right? So we're going to find out all about that in a couple of moments. So. Uh, Right, question one of our quiz. What colour were Caesar's eyes? <laughs> right? Now, I need to go back to flying the airplane because, you know, we're getting close to where we need... Are we getting close? We're getting... Well, we're going to speed her up here now in a moment, right? Uh, let's have a look here now. Right, Grant. Jing, hello there. It's good to see you. Bad Dog says, I thought it was Augustus who led the invasion with Vespasian leading the northern part of the invasion. Uh, negative. Uh, Doran says, while you're telling the story, I keep playing um, Asterix and Obelisk in Britain in my head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, incidentally, Caesar would have been pronounced Kaiser. So the word Caesar is the same as Kaiser uh, and Tsar. T-S-A-R. That's the, you know, the Russians use it and Kaiser in Germany. It's Caesar, you know. Weather's clouding up, but pretty. It is. I've no warnings here for ice, but uh, let me see. Outside air temperature, what are we reading? Zero degrees. You can check the wing for icing. We're looking good. So far, so good. Icing is modelled on the aircraft, you'll see it. Uh, the Caesar Chiefs doesn't have the same ring, right? Do you know what I mean? I bet the Romans struggled to navigate through the wind turbines and cargo routes through the English Channel, right? Uh, I expect the first invasion was a combo wrecking mission and a smash and grab. Very much so. Officers, why work when you can delegate your responsibilities? Indeed. Limited intelligence. <laughs> yep, they were officers. What's the most dangerous thing in the world? An officer with a map. Huh. What's the second most dangerous thing in the world? An officer with a compass on a map. Oh. Brown eyes. 
How can Ben Hur had a chariot? What was the timeline of Ben Hur? No, as in chariots in battle. As in Caesar's uh, legions, they never experienced anyone fighting with chariots against them before. No one else in Gaul were using chariots in combat. Everything was always, you know, marching all the legions head to head, you know, burst the head off each other and then withdraw. No one ever used chariots during his Gallic campaign. So when he got to Britain, they used chariots. His troops had no way, no understanding of what the hell is going on. Do you know what I mean? That was the idea. You see, they also didn't have Encarta back then. Do you know, like Caesar wouldn't really have a chance to say, by Jovi, um, how do we manage to beat these lads? They're using chariots. Because the Romans recorded all their military strategy, uh, their tactics, how they managed to do things. A lot of it, they kind of developed based on the conquest. They took over a certain army. Well, they'll learn from them and they would take their doctrine and apply it. But chariot warfare, it, it, Caesar had no real experience of it. Do you know? Lads, look how nice and pretty this is. So we're cruising here about 170 knots. I am going to increase the power a little bit, right? Because we have a bit of a flight now tonight, right? We do have a bit of a flight. So uh, let's have a look here now, right? So power coming up a little bit. It should get us to where it is we need to get to. Thanks, Kaharia. I saw that, so I need to fix that. Roman and Carter would have been a huge pile of marble. Indeed. Didn't learn from Cleopatra's lads. Well, that was after the fact. A second lieutenant on a map is the most dangerous animal in the world. A second lieutenant. Brilliant. Do you know? But, uh, was he not named after the Salant? No. No, no. What's the colour of Merv's hair? Easy now. Easy now. Lieutenant Sobel! What is the goddamn holdup? A, a fence! A barbed wire fence! Ailerons, what are you talking about? What hair? What hair? The hymn has arrived. Come here. Have you been watching um, Masters of the Air? I watched episode five last night. Oh, jeez. It's a very good show, lads. Oh, it's absolutely brilliant. Masters of the Air. It's very, very good. News fan only sees about eight people. Oh, Jesus. Uh, we have a few more than eight, I'd say. There's a Dougal. Lads, great selection of aircraft here. Look at that. We have a plane we can't... Is that... What's that now? Is that the... Hang on. What machine is that? Is that the Vigan? Oh, it's the Raphael. Raphael? It's a wild wombat, ladies and gentlemen. F-35. The Danish Eagle. Looking good. QC Frank. Zythe. Squawk Torque in a 414. Quasi Archer's with us in an MB339. Bakamo's in an A-10. Nice. Uh, Balut is in the Mitsubishi. Uh, Lead Ballooner in a PC-12. I can see Muse fan back there. Muse is in a PC-12. We have a Vision Jet coming up with Rambog. Uh, Corsair is in a PC-21. Max Pilot in a DA-42. You're doing all right, man. You're keeping up with us. Um, EIBMU in a TBM. Same with Dougal. Scundog is in a Tiger. We can hear that Fuga. It's beautiful. Isn't that just gorgeous? Look at the weather there in the background. Isn't it something? Uh, who is this? Summers, thank you very much indeed. Pretty kind of you for the Prime subscription. Cheers. Uh, some of us are up front, Murph, says Eamon. Oh, good man. Far, far away is... Far, far away. Uh, in the TBM. Looking good, looking good. Fly guy in the TBM 850. Master Ludwig is in the 414. The various in a... Is it a Baron or a Bonanza? Dreamy, sleepy, nighty, snoozy snooze. That's the B-58. That's the uh, the Baron, isn't it? Hey, Muttley, good to see you. You're very welcome in. And some of us, in another instance, you're probably... Oh, it's the Baron. Nice. That's a big 10 for good buddy. Is he far, far away or is he very small? Captain Gaiman has subscribed to the channel. Seven months, my guy. Thank you very, very much indeed. Look at that cut of this aeroplane, though. Isn't it gorgeous? Man alive. You gotta love it. Right, let's um, <clears throat> let's focus in on some of our systems here for the moment, right? So, torque. We can go an awful lot higher. I mean, we should be able to cruise, I'd say, 220, maybe? Um, Let's have a look here now. So, let's change our fields here for the minute, right? Uh, 
Let's see. ETA or ETE. Estimated time to waypoint. Estimated time to... So an hour 35. Which is a bit of a spin, right? What time are we? Half nine. We're not a million miles off. I'm just going to increase some of that power here a little bit. We're going to be landing into Brussels, which is a huge airport, lads. Uh, I'm using Aerosoft's Brussels. Let's bring up Navigraph to see what the accuracy is like here, because we can see we're in all kinds of weather. If we zoom in, let the weather play. So this is what we're currently flying over. See this? How awesome is that? We will get a little bit of a break, and then we're flying into more of it. And as we have a look at kind of Brussels, we're going to check out the conditions up there. So let's go back to airports. Let's have a look at Brussels. Echo Bravo Bravo Romeo. And uh, let's go into the aircraft, open the aircraft, or open the airport. And let's have a look at the weather. So the raw meter is giving us wind at 2506 knots, few clouds uh, at 3,500. Temperature is 8 degrees, with no significant change. So it, it's not raining in Brussels, right? I laugh at your huge airport. <laughs> uh, it's a baby airport. Let's look at the forecast, or TAF, the terminal area forecast. So it's going to be... Uh, let me see now. 300 at 8. Uh, scatter clouds, probability 30. Via 4 conditions, we're good, lads. We're good. So, what about uh, LFAC? Let's go and have a look at this, right? Navigraph, by the way, if you don't Can have I get it, a refund? No. Uh, Navigraph is absolutely brilliant. So, let's open the airport here. Let's see, do we have any weather? We do. So, uh, automated. Winds 300 at 9. Um, no cloud. Interesting. Becoming 230 at 6. No significant change. Okay, so it's nice and dry up this neck of the woods. That's that's what we're trying to plan. And then once we get up into England, uh, we'll see what the crack is a little bit later on. But certainly for now, we're moving through these clouds. Then they will become a thing of the past. And, uh, you know, we're going to ramble into clear skies here shortly. And... Well, it's looking very, very nice indeed, isn't it? I mean, look at that. Isn't that beautiful? That is beautiful. Uh, it's no different uh, to Camp Bastion and Camp uh, Levenek in Afghanistan. It was bigger than most cities. I came in halfway during the conversation. Haven't had much time to play with Navigraph since I've bought it. Navigraph, I think it's like... Put it this way, lads. I used to use... just. Uh, I used to use... What's the gadget called? Foreflight. I used to use Foreflight all the time. And uh, as brilliant as it is, and it is brilliant, Foreflight is brilliant, hands down brilliant. It's expensive. It's an expensive little gadget. And if you're going to do some real world flying, I highly recommend it because then you can use it for both, right? I can't get clouds to show up in my Navigraph. I'll show you here, Muse. So if you click on weather, and you want to select radar. If you're looking for cloud cover, that's what it should give you. That's the cloud cover. But you need to select from the option below. We can look at all sorts of jazz here. I mean, look, at we can look at visibility, for example, right? So you can see these areas popping up. That's probably an indication of fog, is it? Or maybe rain or something coming in. So look at it there now. Let me see. 1700, 1800. There you go. Coming in. Look. That's probably a, a band of, of weather moving in. Uh, what else can we do? High cloud top level. Yep. Uh, let me see now. Low cloud top level. Plenty of clouds. We need to make sure you click on the gadget. Are you using the TDS or the PMS? Saber, I'm using the PMS one. We asked Navigraph to build a four flight, uh, and in two years they did it, and didn't increase its monthly costs. That's what that could, that's what tells you about the company. Yeah. Murph, did you see the nighttime photo I posted in the Bremen Bar this week? I'm not quite sure actually. Uh, Rita Patterson, thank you very very much indeed for the subscribe on YouTube. Captain Gaiman, I don't think so. Uh, post it again though. Uh, Navigraph is brilliant, and it's not because I like them as a company. Their product is brilliant. This thing, since version 8, I think, came out, they completely changed the game because they've included VF4. Prior to that, this was the most important when it came to IF4 flying, all your charts and all of this, but now they have VF4, and i got to say, lads, 
It's absolutely incredible. It's incredible. Right? Brilliant. Uh, it's about nine or ten bucks a month. I think you can cancel at any time, so even if you just want to grab it for a Dreamy, month, sleepy, nighty, snoozy snooze. You know, or two months to see what you think about it. I highly, highly recommend it. It is absolutely friggin' brilliant. The Danish Eagle is upside down. Look at this for weather. It's absolutely stunning. My poor old frame rate tonight. What are we getting? 40? 30? It's a jizz. Frames are heavy tonight, but sure, listen. We'll keep her going and see what happens, right? We'll keep her going. Post it. Just have a look. Is it in there now? Dude, have you been drinking? I have, Ted. I've been drinking like a mad idiot. Look at the state of this photo, lads. That photo is from Captain Game and flying in the PC-12 in the real world. Isn't that absolutely gorgeous? He took that with his phone. Did you take? Did you do that on Valentine's Day? Nine pounds and you can cancel. If you cross sim, then one subscription will run all sims that support. Yeah. yeah. You do it on Valentine's Day? Yes, smooth devil you. Brilliant. That's fantastic. What a photo, man. Jesus. I love that. I absolutely love that. Now, where was I at? I was over here. What was I doing? You were doing the thing, Murph. Yes, yes, yes. Now, let's have a look. Let's have a look. There's the cloud. Oh, look at the cloud layer up there. Look at that. It's absolutely friggin' gorgeous, lads. I'm loving it. Right, so we'll keep Nevergraph open there when we need it, right? Uh, Milky Way go burr, right? Starting to use Volanta, what is your opinion? Volanta is very good. It's a great flight, kind of a tracker, right? And it'll show you things like Vatsim coverage and things. Um, I like Volanta. Again, I have the premium version of, uh, Atlant of Volanta. It's pretty nice. But I think, like, I don't know what Nevergraph charts i don't know what these guys can do over the coming months in terms of updates we've seen them with the insim panel that's now able to inject your flight plan that you create inside a navigraph directly into your aircraft that's pretty cool right i think i would love to see a feature with navigraph that'll show you maybe other traffic network traffic perhaps on vatsim show controllers maybe you know what i mean um wouldn't it be cool, for example, if you were to click on an airport that was active using VATSIM and when you click on it, well, Navigraph will start reading it to say the following runways are active. These are all the charts that you might need. Do you know what I mean? That'd be pretty cool, right? Um, I'd also like to see perhaps maybe a module for your aircraft. Now, that could be getting a little bit kind of out of scope of what Navigraph is. I mean, charts is what they do. But wouldn't it be nice to see something with your aircraft? So you can track it. Where did you last leave it? But these are all things that Volanta do. Um, and of course, there's another great program if you don't, if you have it or don't have it. It's called uh, Sim Toolkit Pro. That's very, very powerful. Uh, I hope you're flying IFR. Otherwise, I have a number for you to call. We're flying uh, IFR, but not in the conventional sense. I fly rivers or I follow rivers. <laughs> yeah, this isn't exactly uh, VFR friendly. There's a couple of little features that a uh, little nav map has. It'd be nice to see them in Navigraph 2. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Um, a performance page. Yeah, that'd be pretty nice. Like, they do have this new ticker tape stuff down the bottom. I would love to be able to export this and, like, put it in a stream. See all these uh, metrics? I would love to be able to put these metrics uh, and post them onto a, onto a stream, right? So it's not IFM, I follow Murph? No. <laughs> Unfortunately not. Um, so what I'm looking to do here now, right? If I ramble over here to this screen. Hello. And if I go to here. So my sim audio is ticking over. So what we have here, what we can see on the screen. Wait, why aren't they working? Uh, activate them there for a second, Murph. There we go. There's me dials working now, right? So what I have here, um, what I have working here, that's a problem, Murph. Easy now, easy, easy. Fix that, fix that, fix that, fix that, 
There we go. Uh, what I have working here is, well, this is the aircraft, obviously. We can see our indicated airspeed. We can see our artificial horizon, altitude, and also um, a compass, right? Up on the very top of the screen, we have a route. And this is all being powered by Sim Toolkit Pro, right? Now, how can I show you this? If I can do, like, is it a window capture? Let's see if I can bring this in, lads, right? Uh, window capture. New window capture. Uh, not Discord, Murph. Uh, this one. So this is Sim Toolkit Pro, right? This is what I'm looking at here at the moment. And again, I'll make it, I'll make it full screen so you can see it. So this is using Sim Toolkit Pro, all right? And again, you can see kind of what, what's happening in terms of the weather and where everything is and where it isn't, all right? Uh, we can see what our route is doing. But if I go into this, uh, if I go into the program itself, well, I can move things around, right? So we have all these options. We can turn on stuff. It's, it's going to be very similar to what you'd have in the likes of, say, uh, oh, I don't know, Little Nav Map. Uh, you'll have them on some other website. So you can see, look, so this is our takeoff at EDFM. This is what it's going to look like at Luton. And again, it's showing you a visual representation of that runway and what direction the wind is blowing. I think this is really, really handy. I love this feature, right? Navigraph, take note. Uh, some of the flight tools that we have. So we have a scratch pad. So we can type in stuff, say hello, goodbye, whatever it is. Uh, export and pre-file onto a network. Then you have all your map view stuff. So you can have a look at VATSIM traffic or IVAO traffic or... Do you know what I mean? And you can change all the different modes. It's pretty nice what you can do here. And then we have the rain radar. Original, universal, you can change it. So you have a lot of options when it comes to customizing your view here. I think they've done a great job. Do you know what I mean? They've done a great job. So uh, let's waddy that one out. Here we go. So uh, yeah, that's what that does. You know? Brilliant. Uh, right. It's a great tool for free. It is for free. It is free. Uh, Monsieur All Safe says, liked using Sim Toolkit Pro, uh, but I couldn't get it to stop crashing. Changed computer and everything. Really? It, it, from a couple of, well, a couple of months ago, I've only started using it again. I haven't used it in quite some time. But certainly, you know, I used to use it exclusively and then I stopped. Do you know? Dougal says we're in the soup. I think we're out of the soup. This should be the last of it, though, shouldn't it? We hope. Jesus, we hope. So have Mur has Murph put the inertial separator on? That's the question. My, iner my inertial separator is on. Yes. Probably should be off at this stage, should it? The only issue with not using live weather is that you just can't get accurate meat hair for the airports. Yeah. And then you have some of this. Some of the clouds don't come across terribly well. You know what I mean? Some of them are brilliant, right? But some of them are awful. Absolutely awful. So I think we're looking good. I don't know what... What's the ETA of this entire route? Uh, well, it says ETA... I put the swing it, baby! <laughs> Jeez, I think the ETA is dating just over an hour, but look at this. We're picking up... See, the shakage, lads. We're picking up some turbulence. Look at that. Is that right? Oh, my beloved frame rate. We were hopping around. God almighty, Eagle Airways. Aaron has gifted 10 tier 1 subscriptions. What? Thank you very, very much indeed. That is insane support, lads. Uh, incredible. Uh, yeah, Monsieur, I don't know why the uh, the bot is, is grabbing you there. It needs it needs a bit of training in the Parel uh, bot. Do you know? I use my phone with Navigraph map. That's really good, Goblin, yeah. Hey, Patrick is here. Happy Monday, Patrick. You're very welcome in. Uh, but Eagle Airways, oh, a, a 10 bomb straight into it. Thank you very, very much indeed, my guy. That's incredible support. Thank you. Kahari rolls into the blankie at the back seat and hope the Romans won't take the blankie away. Ah, brilliant. Uh, we usually close it at a thousand feet unless there's icing or heavy precip. I've no precip, so you'll close it at a thousand feet. That will increase my torque, no doubt. We'll close her up. A thousand feet, you say. So we were at 28 point something. That's going to automatically climb now. I imagine she'll stop at about 31. Oh. She's doing more. 
Jesus. Wonder how hard this'll go. Uh the bot has stopped targeting me for the change. Right? Yeah, don't worry, lads. If the bot is, is acting the, the maggot, uh try not to worry about it. It's still in training. It's using AI, not artificial intelligence. Almost intelligence. It's a new type of thing. Uh 32.8. So Jesus, that was a fair peak, wasn't it? Uh should 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 so negative G now that they're in the back. Hmm. Put it to 34 and enjoy. Uh, we're going okay. 216 indicated. We're cruising along, lads. We have some beautiful airplanes with us. Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? Even with the clouds the way they are. I bought a PC12. I bought a P12 and got a refund. Tell me what happened. Can I get a refund? No, there's no refunds. Uh, Sean Dale says, Murph, Gibbo has been trying to help me fix the pixel edge clouds. Some look stunning, but then you have to make clouds. Uh, he had some great videos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just be careful with that, right? There is a way that you can go in. You can get into your flight sim uh, configuration settings. And you can put in a bit of code that will sharpen the, the cloud. Be very careful because that will have a fairly substantial impact on your performance. You need to be careful with that. It'll make, it, it'll make a beautiful change, but you just have to be careful when it comes to your frame rate. What's more important? The clouds for me at the moment, they look pretty nice. There's a bit of pixelation up here. Uh, I rarely have issues with live clouds. It's only when I'm using the other ones. Do you know what I mean? Bacelli has subscribed at a tier one. Thank you very, very much indeed. He says, Murph, the way you like to kick furniture, I'm surprised you don't own a pair of solid steel Crocs. An important announcement needs to be made. I have misplaced my Crocs. They're in the house somewhere. Mr. Tutone wore them the other night putting the bins out. I haven't seen them since. But I know they came back in because I asked her. I asked her, right? Um, but yes, I can't find the Crocs. Sometimes I fly in Crocs. Sometimes that's all I wear. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> moving on. Uh, where are we at? Oh, we're nearly in Brussels. Ah, the Belgians. Great bunch of lads. Uh, yeah, she threw them out. No, she didn't. Do you remember that video with Gibbo throwing the Crocs in the bin? They were a Christmas present and he fired them into the bin. My emotions were on the floor that day. Jesus. That was terrible. Mr. Two-Tone just took them to goodwill to help families in need. Maybe. Maybe. He lost his Crocs. I didn't lose them. Are we stopping for waffles? Yes. Crocs make your feet stink. Larry! No, they don't. Larry! Larry, like, Crocs have holes in them to allow the air circulate. Crocs were invented by the Irish, right, in 1727 in an air tunnel for aerodynamic purposes. Yep, that's what happened, lads. Uh, they're in the new kitchen cupboards. <sighs> uh, did you check the moat? I didn't. One must wash their feet before entering the Crocs. That would be the secret. Paparazzi spoken like a true nobleman. Indeed, indeed. The Irish Crocs were made out of mouldy potatoes. What? Barefoot rubber equals sweat. No, you don't get the ones with just rubber. You get the ones that have a padage, a padage set up. Do you know what I mean? Those holes are to allow your dignity to escape. <laughs> oh. Uh, Paradiski, good to see you. Good evening from the UK. Very good evening from Ireland. I hope you're well, man. Right, we're in turbulence here because we're getting bashed, shake, rattle and rolled. But we're going to be doing an approach into Brussels. We have the mussels from Brussels. Now, I need to check uh, the weather uh, situation in Brussels. EBBR. And, uh, well, what runway can we have, please? Runway, depending on the wind, is telling us one niner or two five right or two five left. All right. Let's zoom it in. Two five left. Two five right. Or one niner. I'm going to go with two five left because it's not a we're not it's a lot a although the military apron is over there it's not a long stop two five left and let me see i want to exit on charlie two but then back taxi on looks to be victor one uh back to yankee and then charlie one and then back out again 
we can do an intersection departure. So that's the plan. Runway 25 left. We'll vacate the runway at Charlie 2, swing around to the right hand side and do an intersection departure back out. All right. That's the plan, lads. So what we need to do here, what we need to tell the aircraft, hey, we're going to go heading mode. So heading mode has been set. We're going to turn the dial. Da -da 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 -da. Let's put in, oh, I don't know, 330 degrees. 330 degrees. Current altitude, uh, turn you off, 4,500. We're going to go down to 2,500. We're going to arm you. And our V-speed, well, we're going to descend at a gentle 1,000 feet per minute. Engage. Now we're going to watch our speed as we're doing this. Fog at Brussels, really? Uh, Mr. Anderson, do they make crocs that fit donkey feet for maritime operations? I don't know, but I hope they do. Reuben says, uh, and did those Irish feet in ancient time wear crocs too? Yes, yes they have. Uh, what happened to Jeremy? He's taking a rest. He's taking a rest. <laughs> uh, we're passing the city of St. Truden on your right, uh, where there's a statue of uh, Ambrix. The king of the uh, Burons, is it? Who lured the legion of Cotto and Sabinus into an ambush during the battle of uh, Atuache. That's nuts. ILS frequency 110.35. Nice. 110.35, we could play with that. Sure. One zero three five two four three. Okay, so our DME is telling us we're eighteen point two kilometers out. Uh, course should be set to two four nine. -er. Oh no, wait, it shouldn't. What am I saying? Muse, what course should we be on? You're a bit too far gone for the ILS. I wouldn't say so. Wait now, why didn't we turn? Heading mode, please. And why aren't we descending? What are we not doing right here, lads? <laughs> There we go. Right, okay. Uh, info, all done. I'm free now. Free from my meeting. You were in a meeting? We didn't even know. Uh, 249 Muse, is it? Course is 249? 249er. Okay, a DME, or distance measuring equipment, 14.7. And when this lad, when this guy lines up, we turn hard left. Coke 276 is here. How are you, Murph? Uh, from down the road in County of Blah. Wait, County of Blahs, or is it Baz? You're very welcome in. Turn early, it's slow, gotcha. Okay, we'll keep an eye on it. Let's see what it does. So basically, we have the the, uh, the localizers tuned in, right? The localizers, probably, it's, it's usually just at the end of, of the base of the runway, yeah? Anyway, uh, DME is telling us that it's about 13 uh, nautical miles. The course is going to be 249er. I'm currently on a heading of 330 degrees, okay? And to make life a little bit easier, well, we're descending nicely. We've got a thousand feet to go. Start bringing some of that power back. Inertia separator, would it be required on landing? Maybe. Uh, approach mode, we can go ahead and probably arm that. Approach is armed, so let's see what happens. So we can see here now, glide slope is lighting up and localizer indicator has lit up as well. So we're doing okay. Altitude passing two, uh, two six, four, two five. Almost at 10 miles. Lights are looking good. Everything here is looking good. Oh, Waterford, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Half deflection, I turn about 20 degrees off, gotcha. So, uh, Go ahead and change our heading now. We'll make life a little bit easier. So, let's see here now. If we need to be at 2-4. Well, 
let's go to about let's go about two eight hopefully this won't be too although that's going to make me final turn a little bit messy isn't it yeah don't do that murph you're mad devil you go back to 300 spartans let's say 300 because i don't know how sharp i want this angle to be i want to go to the base of the runway first if that makes sense two and a half thousand feet bring her down betsy So speed is at 150, coming down nicely. Ooh, it is foggy. Should be okay. Johnny Aardvark, a quick hello from Berlin. Good to see you. You're at the film festival? Uh, two five left. That's a big 10 four, good buddy. Johnny Aardvark, thank you very much indeed. 37 months. Thank you very, very much. Murph, do you fly the E190 much? Uh, I haven't in a while. I will be flying it soon though, Aaron. Uh, that thing has gotten a number of updates. A number of updates. Okay, let's see what happens. We have approach mode armed. Do I put it into nav mode or just leave it on approach mode? Because otherwise she's going to follow heading. You know what I mean? So do I take it out of heading mode? So approach is armed. So we just leave it. It'll even switch from heading mode. That's interesting. Okay, watch the speed coming down. Local barrel pressure, make sure we set that. Should have done that earlier. First stop of the night coming up here, lads. Look at this. This is in the fog. This is beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Now, in terms of our um, vertical speed, VNAV, would you look after that? Right, this needle is going to start moving. Easy. Six miles. Speed coming down. She's a little bit slow. Okay, there's 130-ish. First notch of flaps. Approach flaps. There's, there's a big obstacle with, like, you know, stuff. Easy does it. Okay, she's captured. Nice. You're down. What about the vertical side? This would be interesting. Will it, like, it won't all land, but it should descend me, right? We shall see. Five miles out. We've captured the localizer. There we are. She's descending now. Perfect. Perfect. Around 120 is approach. Uh, 120. Yeah, flaps are already set. Okay, she's climbing again. Didn't like that. Four miles. Light slopes coming down. Outer marker engaged. Or visual. We're on the glide. Vertical speed is dropping down. Speed is looking good. Flaps 30. Three mile final. Localizer set. We're bang on the money for the glide. I should have put in a decision height. Ah, really grand. About a thousand feet to go. 10 knots wind. Yeah, I don't think I'll need more than flaps 30. Speed is just holding over 100. I'm happy enough with that coming in. Right, we're under 1,000 feet. We'll go visual. Keep an eye on things. 
The poppy are happy. Still on the glide, speed is good, flap set 30, landing gear down and green. We're looking good. That's pretty good, yeah, that's good. Right, only a Murphy can mess it now. Autopilot off, my airplane. Easy now, Jemima. Why didn't they all come off with the flaps? Are they not, uh, are they not connected, no? So it should be y'all dampener off, then flaps. And then flaps up, y'all dampener off. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, easy now, Murph. Don't make a complete nutter balls of it. Speed good. There's a little bit under the glide, but we're all right. Just playing off some of the wind. Six knots on the nose. Dreamy, sleepy, nighty, snoozy snooze. That was terrifying. Okay. Easy does it, Jemima. Easy. Touchdown! Easy, easy. How to bait it? Flaps in. Yeah, baby! 96 feet a minute? Eesh. Okay, Charlie 2 is coming up on the right hand side. A tad bit fast. A little bit fast, wasn't it? Little bit fast, but we're alive. Okay, this is our exit here on Charlie 2. Man, look at that DC6. It's freaking gorgeous, isn't it? Okay, so it's going to be a right turn onto Victor 1. Uh, and then we follow it on up and then right turn onto Charlie 1. And we'll do an intersection departure out of 2.5 left as well. Uh... Now would be a good time to check for your fuel as well, lads. Our next leg, considerably smaller. We're just heading out to Calais. Sorry, Murph. Thought you knew about blah. A local breed. Oh, a local bread roll. Oh, the blah. Yeah, yeah, yes. Of course, now I get you. Sorry, Coke. I totally forgot about the blah. I've had the blah. Stab trim is playing up again. I need to fix that. Flaps are in. Victor won. And we taxi on this until we get up to the next spot. Uh, so let me see. So ta uh, I'm down a bit. We'll fix this stab trim. We'll probably put it in low idle as we're taxiing, but we'll be doing this fairly fast. So I'm not overly worried. Oh, I'm going into the back of a DC-6. Drive it on there, Finton, will you? Right, that's our stab trim sorted. <laughs> Don't forget the rudder trim. What was the setting on the rudder trim again, lads? For takeoff. Oh, Jesus, it's over a country mile, isn't it? Look at that. Has it to go all the way over to the green? That seems a bit absurd, but we'll do it. I'm trimming the rudder of the DC-6. I really am. Right, we're going up to the right here. Hang on to your hats, boys. It counters the turn tendencies of the plane, but really all the way to the green, yeah? It's a freaking huge distance across, but sure, we'll do it. Voila, we are in the green. Right. So we're going to do an intersect departure here. Love this airport. Yeah, it's pretty. This is Aerosoft's one. Mega Airport Brussels. Lads, look at the variety of airplanes. I love this. I absolutely love this. Vulcans, Beechcraft, TBMs, Pilatus PC-21s, Vision Jets. Man alive. Beautiful. Hello there. Right, get ourselves onto the active. We shall line up and wait.
All right, all right, all right. Okay, engage the park and break. Hello there. Pelican's there as well, really, yeah? Uh, G Moore, thank you very much indeed for the follow. Uh, don't forget you're in VR war mode, uh, 100%. So let's get ourselves tidied up here for our departure. Flap set 15 for takeoff. Uh, we'll come back into our little gadgets that we're going to look for. 4,500 feet. Thank you. Arm that devil. VS, leave you alone for the minute. Um, although we could probably arm 1,500, couldn't we? Yeah. That'll do. Uh, now we want to go back to nav mode. GPS has been selected. Nav mode has been armed into our autopilot. Trim's looking good. Transponder is looking good. Um, altimeter has been reset. We're looking good. Uh, inertia separator is on. Everything here is looking good. Okay. Uh, we'll put heading mode just to give us a bit of a hand. Okay, friends. Time to blast off again. Are we ready? It's disguised as a bonanza, but it's there. Nice. Keith is loving it as well. Nice. Black Eyes Gabe. You take care, my dude. Great seeing you, man. I'm going to see you soon. Okay, brakes off. Power coming in. Take off power set. The needle is moving. There's 80. Yep, see Daisy. Yep, you devil you. Pause the rate of climb. Gear up. 200 feet. Flaps in. Yaw dampener engaged. Beautiful. Bye bye, Brussels. You've been absolutely freaking gorgeous. Climbing here nicely, 1500 feet per minute. Autopilot. Let's be talking. Engage. Vertical speed activated, 1500 feet per minute. Climbing up to 4,500 feet. Landing gear is up, checked, flaps in. Yard dampener engaged. We shall continue on. Hey, Wayne Prefontaine. Good to see you, man. Can't wait for a multi crew with this. Oh, dude, yes. Yes. So, myself and Gibbo have been testing uh, your controls, shared cockpit, right? And for the most part, it seems to be working out pretty well. But I would definitely have, I'd love to be able to experience shared cockpit with this. Because there's a lot going on underneath the surface, isn't there? Now, come here. Rudder trim. Should that be centered now after takeoff? Oh, it's, oh it does it itself, look. Although the stab trim, well, it's, it is trimming. So the rudder trim autocorrects. Auto trim. Oh, the yaw dampener does it. Yaw dampener does it. Brilliant. You'll be surprised on how many aircraft that doesn't work with. I wonder, is it unique just to the PC-12? I don't actually know. There's a question, lads. Right, for this 96 nautical mile jaunt, uh, we're heading over to Calais. We'll do us a... Let's see, we might do a touch and go there. And uh, what time are we now? 10 o'clock? We're on our way, lads. We're well on our way. What do I think of the Cessna 207 GMR? It's really, really good. Really, really good. It's a beautiful plane, the 207. And it's cheap and cheerful, and I like it. And alive. Look at this. We pour L frame rate, but I don't care. It's beautiful, isn't it? Yeah, I think you can, Captain Gaiman. As I said, like, myself and Gibbon, we've tested it out on a few aircraft. We're probably going to test it out on a few more. You know what I mean? Just to see how it behaves. But, uh, yeah, look, we'll see how we go. Right, lads, we shall do another count. Uh, whereabouts in Ireland am I from? I'm originally from Dublin. And uh, my accent is kind of influenced by Kerry, Tipperary and Dublin. Yeah, something like that. I have a very unique accent. Right, lads, so if you're bobbing along on the Xbox, press 1. If you're here in the PC, press 2. And if you're kind of enjoying things, you know, it's okay. Uh, you can press number 3 and we'll get a bit of a count. Are we ready? Yeah, baby!
beautiful. Beautiful. D d d I've just received an important notification in my mods chat, right? And he's trying to... Fake news, Gibbo. Fake news! Hang on, this is important. <laughs> county Dublin. I wasn't a County Dublin man, it was Dublin 22, right? Right. Anyway, how are we getting on here, lads? Hold oh, the frame rate, Jesus. Oh, I never turned off the old, um... Inertial separation. Now bring that torque back a smidgen because she's going to over torque on me. Easy now, Jemima. Easy now. Okay, torque coming back, but with the inertial separator off, she'll climb. And let's see what happens, right? Uh, now, let me see. Uh, this run on the motorways from Brussels to Calais would empty my Honda VTR 1000 bike. I can imagine. Sabre says, is there an issue with the SWS PC12 not flying ILS approaches? I had an ILS plugged in for Brussels there and uh, approach mode, it never descended. Oh Sabre, just look back. Just scroll back maybe 10-15 minutes. We did a full ILS approach and it worked. It worked well. <sighs> Basically a culty. <laughs> oh Jesus. Now over to my neck of the woods. The kettle is on, lads and ladettes. And I have some nice West uh, Vitrin, is it? In the cellar. Beautiful. I wonder if it's because I'm using the TDS and not the PMS. Possibly. Murph, I found a mug for you. Where do I ship it? Um, really? Uh, I, Jesus. Send it to Two-Tone Murphy, care of the Irish government, Ireland. It'll find me. No, it won't. I'll send you a DM. I'll send you a DM. You found a mug for me. Brilliant. Now, in Ireland, we would reference a mug as your face, right? So, I hope you know. <laughs> I found you a nice face. You can wear this one. Um. So, why were you outcast from Dublin? I wasn't outcast at all, right? As he tries to put on a posh accent. I, uh... I... Jeez. I, I have a lot of influence from Kerry. And, uh... Then I moved to Tipperary... Some years ago. That Mr. Two-Tone, she's the good-looking mug. <laughs> I can argue with that. Um, but yeah, no, I moved down to Tipperary then some years ago uh, with my parents. And uh, funny old story, that. Well, it wasn't a funny... It was a funny, uh, serious... Uh, uh, what was it? Serious case of unfortunate events, do you know? I went parachuting in Holland and I broke my legs and uh, my career choice... It didn't, um, it couldn't follow on. They didn't want me to carry either. <laughs> I'm an outcast, alone, in the herd. Yes. <laughs> right? Now, what was I doing? Uh, where is it now? Right, now, important, important things are happening. So we are moving on towards uh, Calais Dunkirk Airport. Might just do a touch and go here, lads. We'll see. Did you forget me parachute? No, no. By the way, Murph, you, me, London Controller, we're all getting, uh, oh, we're going, get, going drinking in Vegas. Yes. You need to be careful with Jamie. He's a devil on vodka, seemingly. I'll drink gin. Well, probably beer. Some beer gin. Um, do you ever get, wait now, did you ever get the you ain't from round here? Yeah, all the time. You ain't from these parts. You're a weird looking feller. Uh, all the time, right? Um, but yeah, no, I didn't forget the uh, parachute. I tell you, the jump, excellent. The fall, pure bliss. The parachute automatically opening. It was a, t it was a static line. One, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand. And all you hear when you're up there, all you can hear is the little flap going. That's all you hear, right? And you're able to kind of, you know, steer yourself around. But anyway, it was the landing that led to be my inevitable downfall. I landed on the... Uh, I hit the LZ, but I landed on, uh, like, a, a sack of spuds, you know. But yes, Eagle Airways, you take care, my dude. Uh, so, picture this, right? If you were to stand on a table, and don't try this at home, but if you were to stand on a table and do what's called a pencil jump, as in you just jump and land perfectly straight, that's kind of what happened to me, except put about 45 miles per hour movement 
trying to land perfectly on two feet, something somewhere is going to, it'll give, do you know? And I was wearing combat boots and that's what saved my ankles because the bones went all directions just above the boot line. It was called a, <laughs> it was called a compound spiraling fracture. I saw Jesus. Ah, Jesus. I saw Jesus. Do you know? It's not the jump, it's the fall. No, it was the sudden stop. You know? Um, Crocs would have been grand. I might try that now. It sounds like a great idea. Yeah, yeah. And I wouldn't mind, but the lads are like saying, we're, we're doing it in Holland. You know? Primo Victoria, welcome in. West Coast Willie has just raided. Welcome aboard, Raiders. Happy Monday. Hope you guys had a great stream. It is I, Murph. Your man with the head. And uh, well, we're flying in the SWS PC-12. Uh, we're following along the Gallic Wars. And tonight... Dreamy, sleepy, nighty, snoozy snooze. We're focusing on the, uh, on the Roman invasion of Britain. So we've just departed Brussels. We're on our way now to Calais, Dunkirk. Then we're crossing the channel up into England. And uh, we're live on the South East Asian server. Feel free to join along. The more the merrier. And... Uh, well, thank you very, very much indeed for the uh, for the raid, guys. Willie, I hope you had a great stream, man. Uh, but yes, two-tone pencil, right? That'll do, yeah. You should have flapped your massive hands. I'd go, to, I'd go skydiving if I wasn't such a wimp. The lads are saying, oh, the ground is grand and soft in Holland, so you won't even feel it. I was wheelchair-bound for six months, and they brought me to a hospital uh, called the Gemini Hospital in Den Helberg. It's off the main it's off the island of Texel. Oh. Pleasure to be here. Ah oh, dude, thank you so much indeed. Hope you had a great stream. We Captain Gaiman with us here in the chat, who's been helping me along fly this machine. And we have a collection of outstanding pilots who have brought some very pretty aeroplanes, ranging from TBMs, Raphaels, MB three three nines uh, PC-21s, of course, PC-12s, uh, Cessna 414s, got a Vulcan up there somewhere, I see a Hawk, Vision Jets are with us, got a DC-6 somewhere along the line, some beautiful, beautiful aircraft, A320, God almighty, a Baron, a Fuga, it's awesome, did you fall out of, uh, Pontius Pilatus? No, I actually jumped from a Cessna Grand Caravan. So the first and last time I was in a caravan, a Cessna Grand Caravan, I jumped out. There's a story you can tell your kids. And then they look at you and say, Da, you're an idiot. Yes, yes, I am, son. <laughs> Murph, in all my years in the service and jumping, I've never heard of anyone else breaking both. Remind me never to jump at you. Just don't jump with me. Just, do you know what happened, right? There's a logical explanation as to what happened. The wind, so when you're, when you're doing parachute jumping, I don't need to tell you guys, you know the crack. You be sh I'll show you the, f I'll actually show you the place. So here's Dessel or Texel, right? And there's an X marks the spot where you're supposed to land. Uh, uh, so we took off from here. So it, it was over here somewhere, wasn't it? Uh, where are you? Have they moved it? So the pros land in this little area, and that's where they do all the parachute training down here. But there's an X mark to spot over here somewhere. It's near enough the runway. And they tell you, right? They tell you, when you land on the ground, get up quick, otherwise we'll assume something is wrong. Right? Anyway, the instruction was, once you're below 500 feet in your altimeter, right? 500 feet, uh, the racetrack, see this racetrack here? Well, that's your, uh, that's your visual reference point. So we were at... Just yeah. over, we're going the wrong way. Just over five thousand feet when we, when we bailed out, and uh, we we bailed out over here somewhere. We're up around the north part of the island. There's a place up here, lads, called the Cockstrop. I can tell you, they did. But anyway, uh, you ramble down this way. That was awful. You ramble down this way in your parachute, and you do a number of turns, left hand or right hand, doesn't really matter. But once your altimeter reads five hundred feet. No more turning, because when you pull down on either side of your parachute, you lose altitude quickly. Right? Uh, but anyway, what happened was, um, we were told... Dougal, have you been drinking? I have, Ted. I've been drinking like a mad idiot. What happened was, I turned... You're supposed to turn and face the wind on your final, right? And, you know, just before you, just before you get to the ground, usually maybe 
10, 15 feet. It's kind of hard to gauge it, but you roughly get it. You do what's called a flare. That's pulling both cords of the chute, allowing the air to rush up into the chute, decelling your uh, descent, slowing your descent, and then you perform what's called a PLF, a parachute landing fall, for which we had practiced or practiced many times. Had nothing got to do with the fact that I was fairly drunk during most of the training. That's just a by the bottom. We're Irish, we're Irish, right? And uh, the Dutch were like, you know, it's, uh, 12 hours between drinking the beer and uh, doing the training. And I was like, what? What are you talking about? 12 hours, eight hours, bottle to throttle. That's all you need. Uh, and the day of our jump, we were steaming. Uh, they left us outside in the sun to kind of burn. Anyway, that's not important. What is important, the wind was blowing from kind of the southeast to the northwest, meaning that you would turn directly over the airport, looking at the racetrack dead ahead, and you should be facing the wind, and you go through with your landing. What actually happened? The wind suddenly changed direction, and it moved the opposite we read into it after. It was a, it's a weird phenomenon that happens up this neck of the woods. The lads up at Helgeland know all about it, right? But anyway, the wind had changed. It wasn't strong. You're talking maybe four knots, five knots, right? So my approach is great. They've done studies, you know. 60% of the time, it works. Every time. Every time. My approach is great. Uh, the accuracy of where I was supposed to land, bang on, right? My buddy was ahead of me. My other mate was up behind me. I was shouting all sorts of mad things. Rawr, Tema, rawr, right, as you do, right? <clears throat> and uh, I can see the, the landing zone. And now the other lads after me, they got scattered all over the place. All over the place because the wind had changed. Fella, one fella, he ended up about a mile away from the airport and he got a lift. Right, right anyway, uh, so uh, my approach came in, hit the ground. Ouch, I thought. It sounded, do you know that sound you get, lads? Did you ever walk into a forest in the autumn time, late autumn, and there's some twigs on the ground, and they're very dry at this stage, of course, after the entire summer heating them up. And you were to step on one of those twigs, and you hear the... Well, that was the sound I heard. Damn funny. That sounded like a twig breaking, I thought. Right? Uh, and uh, I didn't realise I was hurt, because you're full of adrenaline. I mean, you just jumped out of a freaking plane, right? Uh, anyway, what happened next was, and I forgot this in my training, when you land, pull in your chute. Otherwise, it'll take you for a, a spin, you know. So when I landed, of course, I'm on the ground, face down, thinking, Jesus, that was hilarious. Uh, and next thing, a bit of wind, grabbed the parachute, and now it dragged me. Now, go back to that sound I told you about the twig in the summertime in the forest. Right. Well, get maybe 20 of them and line them up perfectly, and then get something very, very heavy to drive over them. Multiplied by, you know, the, anyway, the sounds were just like, holy crap. And um, so, yeah, the, my leg pulled and of course, that's when I felt pain and autumn, not fall. Fall, yeah, yeah. Uh, I saw, that's when I saw Jesus. Oh, Jesus. And uh, my mate came over. He had his parachute wrapped under his arm and he's from Kerry. And the first thing he did, he gave me the swiftest kick in the arse. Get up, you gobshite, he says. Sure, didn't they tell us not to be lying down? And I was like, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no. Medic! Medic! He's like, what's wrong with you? I says, I can't move. I'm at to do my legs in. He goes, no, you didn't. I said, there's something not right here. My legs are in terrible mess. And then he went over and he saw what had happened. Uh, this compound on my left leg. The right leg was just shagged. But the left leg, that was impressive. I mean, that was impressive. So a compound spiraling fracture. A compound means the bone has gone through the leg and a spiral will think of it. Anyway, so he had to sit down for a minute and drop a small vomit. And uh, next thing I think the owner came over and he's like, uh, yes, yes, very hot here today. And I was like, listen, mate, cut this thing off me back. Give me a cigarette and I'd be grand, you know. And uh, they had, it's so funny, they had to call an ambulance. I'm supposed to be talking about Roman history. They, uh, they had to call an ambulance and like, just to kind of put this into perspective, lads, right? A lot of Dutch people and German people holiday up here. Well, the ambulance is dispatched from Den Helder. We're on a friggin' island, so it has to get the ferry across, right? So I was lying on the ground anyway, and uh, in a hoop. And uh, the lads are coming over. Jesus Murphy, you're right. No. Uh -huh. And I, I was like, take the parachute off me back, because I couldn't, I couldn't lie. I, I was leaning forward, and, I, you know, it was sore, right? 
And your mom was like, no, no, if we have to open this, it needs a thousand hour inspection. I was like, feck your thousand hour inspection. Get it off me back. So the lads cut off the shoe. That was grand. About an hour passed and uh, an ambulance then came up. And meanwhile, there's like people walking around going, oh my God, who's this poor Egypt? Like, is he alive? And uh, the paramedics gave me whatever shot of something. I just didn't care about life anymore at all. I was happy out. In my imagination, because of the painkillers, I was swimming with seahorses named Pascal and Antoinette. I was I was out of it, man. And there was a, <laughs> there was a great photo uh, taken and it was put up in our unit headquarters enlarged and it's a picture of all the lads linked arms in their combats you know and then there's one single boot with me bush cap sitting on the boot and a gap there's Murphy <laughs> right oh and then you know the ambulance picked me up drove off that was grand they had to delay the ferry people were going nuts because their holiday connections or whatever were late and then it was sent into hospital and uh yeah the rest is uh the rest is kind of history but yeah that was um that was a moment with Murph. A moment with Murph. You know. Stick figure, right? Ages, you should have just landed in the sea. Right? Oh. I can't even drink my coffee. Right? Did I ever tell you the time then when I was in the hospital and about the nurse? Shh. Now you're not to tell anyone this, right? This is only between us. Don't tell fucking anyone. Right? So when you're in hospital and you're wired up to all the... Do you know? And the operation. When I went into the ER, your man had a freaking DeWalt drill. A DeWalt branded drill. Because I, I got plates and screws. And, anyway, that's not important. What is important, anyway, when you're plugged into the gadget, they kind of divert your plumbing. You know what I mean? So that, you know, if you need to, you know, have a pee, well, you don't know about it. It, it ends up in the bag and it's all grand, right? So anyway, I was unplugged from this. And it was about 11 o'clock one morning. I was there for a while. About 11 o'clock one morning and I said, no, no, I got this. So I'm cast it up and I said, no, I can hover. I'll hover to the jacks. I want me dignity. I'm not peeing in a thing in a bed. So I went in anyway. <laughs> this is terrible now. I went in anyway and I wedged a crutch top left and I wedged the other crutch back right and I balanced myself. Yep. This is going to work, I said. Brilliant. And I proceeded to yeah, have a urination. And uh, if, if you've ever noticed, anyone who's had, like, an operation, right? Um, well, your pee is, like, tremendously different colour. Frightening, in fact. Frightening. Jesus. Nothing kind of weird or nothing, but very dark, right? So I proceeded to pee. And whatever move I made, something in the buoyancy failed and I fell. And oh, 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 there were the sounds coming out of me and the sound of a crutch hitting the door. And with that, this lovely nurse, she was very nice. I didn't get her name. She came in and she, are you okay in there? I said, like, no, Jesus, don't come in. I'm now in a heap and I'm making a mess. As you could have imagined, the aiming is now completely shot. Like a baby lamb. Do you know what she did? She came in under me arm, under the crutch with her head and went to lift me up. So her head is now under my arm and she's repositioning me so I'm standing straight. Brilliant, I thought. And nurses, of course, but they wear the white overcoat scrub thingies, right? Little did I know at this point, but I had been for the entire duration of her inserting her head under my arm to lift me up straight. I was peeing full force onto this beautiful white coat that she was wearing. Ouch out you to know uh, I peed all over and uh, she was all fine about it next thing I was put in the bed and this big feckin' heavy set nurse with a cigarette and a goatee came in and she scrubbed the bejesus out of me to clean me up I cried a little that night I'm not going to lie you know life at that point was looking kind of bleak but um let's uh let's talk about the Romans here for a while right and that's how I met your mother. Could you imagine? Do you know what I mean? Um, that's a story to walk in on. Hey, Keen, good to see you. DVD review, dude. Good to see you. Right? I was marking my territory. Yeah, yeah. Hello there. Are we really discussing Murph Wing and the nurse? But it actually happened. Genuinely happened. Few people have those sorts of stories. Few people have to pay money for that sort of stuff. Right? Pete all over. God almighty. 
Where are we flying out of? Uh, well, we're going to be flying into um, Calais, Dunkirk. That's our next stop. And we are... We flew from Brussels and we're about to cross the channel. And I'm looking at the time. And once again, lads, I have completely underestimated the flying time. Because it's now half past ten and we still have another... Eh, 130 miles... No, about 105 nautical miles to go. We're going to make this next bit quick. So we're going to... Uh, let me see... I don't think I'm going to land here, lads. I'm going to overfly this airport. And then we're just going to cross the channel because it's getting late. Do you know what I mean? Did you share a cigarette after? No. Uh, the God Pharaoh. Uh, I follow just for more stories like this one. I am a liability, yeah. Hover to the jacks. I want my dignity are the first words that I hear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Nutty Slack says, Murph, uh, we can't take you anywhere except to go back and say sorry. Right. Oh, just take the Vulcan, right? Imagine that happening to you, though. I told a very select few people, and they were like, for God's sake, Murph, right? Do you know? And now, well, it's, it's only us that know, right? Keep it that way. Don't tell anyone. But yeah, Jesus, could you imagine? And like, this, <laughs> the smell and the colours and... Ah! I didn't have a word of Dutch, so what, whenever they came around for tea time or for supper... Uh, you know, I couldn't read what was on it and all I could figure out was bread and jam. So I'd order bread and jam sandwiches all the time. They thought it was like, you know, special. Uh, and next thing, like, the fella beside me, he'd get a big friggin' roast dinner. I'd be like, what? What's the name of that? And he'd give me the name of it. Do you know, and I'm there eating me jam sandwich thinking life is crap. He's eating a big roast. And then the next day I'd be like, I'm ordering that roast. And then I'd order it and like, whatever they'd say. They're like, no, we don't have it. What do you mean you don't? I want, and then he'd order something else, so I had to revert to jam sandwiches. And then your man would order something like chicken cordon bleu or something. Real sexy stuff. And I'm thinking, yeah, but how did you... What's the name of that one? Every day I was in that hospital, bread and jam. That's all... And butter. That's all I could do. Meanwhile, everyone else was eating, like, at the friggin' Ritz. <sighs> Colonel Fork has burst in the door with a tier three subscription. Jesus 43 months and I wouldn't trade it not even for a Skoda thank you very very much indeed Colonel Fork it's great to see you man uh, I spent a month in a German hospital but this is a Dutch hospital do you know you are special very spe yeah D Dutch a great bunch of lads right <laughs> make a Monday series out of this event oh. hey Dan is here good to see you uh, El Papino hello from France bonjour bonsoir good to see you um, 250 million and Murph was the fastest. <laughs> <coughs> Brilliant. Have I arrived at a medical stream? Not at all. Please state the nature of the medical emergency. I wonder if the wet nurse arranged that. Possibly. Possibly. Would you rather eat bread and jam for a month or eat stew? Oh, bread and jam. You know. Why did you just not order what you got? Because they already gave it to me. So you, you have to... It's like a hotel. You order it, Right? And then like 20 minutes, half an hour later, they come in with all the food and you're looking going. And like, I didn't have, I can't speak Dutch, you know, for the glurgen, explurgen. I can name a couple of Dutch parts of like an, an anti-aircraft gun. That's about it, right? A bofer. But that's about it. Um, glurgen on, you know. Anyway, um, we're crossing the channel, lads. Look at this. Yes. I'm in a glass case of emotion. Right. But yeah, no, I couldn't order any of the, uh, the local food. What do you do? Uh, Liberty Flight, good to see you. Bofort is Swedish and not Dutch. No, no, but the guns that we got were from the Dutch. It's a long story, Scott. But yeah, the, the Bofors we got, which are built in Sweden, the L70s, uh, we got them from the Dutch. A slice of Bofor, indeed. Great neck of the woods uh, to take the motorbike. Oh, yeah. Why don't we try and parachute the Sting S4? Where Murphy tried to land. <laughs> No, no, hang on. I landed exactly where I was, I, I was supposed to. Have I photos of this? I do, lads. I have pictures of this. Yeah. Uh, where will I find these now? There's even a video of me jumping out of the plane where I thought everything was going grand. You know, until it wasn't. Hang on now, we'll find this. I'll show you a picture or two. I don't have the one now with the nurse, just in case you were wondering, right? <laughs> right, where is this now? If I go into photos. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, if I click on my profile, I go to photos. No, ah, Jesus, Murph. 
Bit of photos here now, right? See all photos. Let's have a look, right? Is there any pictures of me doing the thing in the oak with the stuff? I think there is. Uh, I do stupid things so you don't have to. Always remember that, lads, right? I'll do the stupid things. Uh, where are we here now? Really? I don't have a photo. Where have I got a photo? Hang on, I'll find a photo. I'll find you a photo. Let's see. Backups. Robin. Balls, that's empty. Uh, really? PC? Uh, private house? No. Jesus, where is this, lads? We need to find it. Flight sim. Goose. Backup. Desktop. Oh, where have I got this stuff? I bet you it's on, um... Oh, I bet you it's on a external hard drive. I bet you it's on an external hard drive. It's probably on an external hard drive. Uh, I love your last video with the scoring system. That was fantastically done. Uh, Liberty Flight, thank you very, very much indeed. I'm glad you liked it, man. I'm glad you liked it. Um, I'm just trying to find this... Um, This video, or the, not the video, the, uh, why didn't I put my photos in there? Balls, anyway. Hmm. I don't see any photos, I thought I had photos on uh, Facebook, no? Unless the lads have, the lads update them. It's years ago now since I did this. I've matured, uh, you know, right, since then. There's a picture of me on my crutches when I got awarded the Purple Heart. Right? <laughs> When we got back to Dublin, look at the head of me. We went into, uh, we went into Baldonnell, into the NCO's mess. I was awarded a purple heart. Look at the head in it, look. I was pointing a bit of a weird face. Right? I've matured a teeny tiny bit. They gave me a purple heart, lads. I mean, where would you get it, right? Where would you get it? But is there not a picture of me in the hospital or with the lads? There has to be. I didn't see any, but that's not to say they're not there. I'll have a quick browse, and then if I can't find it, I'll find them during the week, and I will post them on Discord. And by the way, if you're new here, well, do be sure to check out our Discord channel, exclamation point Discord. Uh, we'll give you the link, and you're more than welcome to join in. Uh, and that's pretty much where we spend all our time taking the Dennis Hickey out of me. It's not very hard. Um, I do stupid stuff all the time. Your photo. Oh, wait, hang on. Your photos. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Do we have a photo of the thing? Surely to God we have. Surely I have a picture of this on Facebook. Surely. Surely you can't be serious. Uh, Jesus, the amount of stuff. No, I don't. I have a picture of me after I broke my leg. Uh... How very strange. How very strange. Albums? Yeah, I'll dig them out for you during the week, lads. I have, I have a couple of photos. A couple of mad ones, right? Uh, now, let me see. Um, Moobot just kicked Keen. Uh-oh. Uh, he came on as a sub in the 60 cent minute for some Murph bot. <laughs> Oh, he'll be on the nurse so we don't have to, right? All right, back to work for me. Crown Fork, it's great to see you and thank you so very much indeed. We'll see you soon, mate. We'll see you soon. Oh. I showed you the video before. I will then. There we go. Uh, Cliffs of Dover approaching. Isn't that a sight? Isn't that a sight? Isn't that absolutely gorgeous? Hang on a second. We're just about to invade Rome. No, I mean England. Hang on. Have we music for this? Uh... We'll play a bit of music, lads. How's that? Right 
as we approach Britain. have arrived in Britain. Absolutely mad, lads. Isn't it mad? Now, let's see. I love that music. Right, so, the second invasion, right? Caesar came here twice, lads, right? So in preparation for his second invasion of Britain in 54 BC, Caesar adopted a significantly more strategic and well-prepared approach compared to his initial foray the previous year. Over the winter, leveraging the knowledge gained from the Venetic shipbuilding techniques, new ships were constructed. These vessels were designed to be broader and lower, optimising them for easier beaching upon arrival in Britain. Now, the Romans weren't great at, you know, seafaring. They weren't rubbish at it. Whatever chance they had in the Mediterranean, well, the choppy Atlantic across the English Channel, forget it. For this expedition, Caesar amassed a formidable fleet of 800 ships and escalated his force to include five legions with 2,000 cavalry units. He only brought two legions the first time. Understanding the importance of maintaining stability in Gaul while he was away, but Caesar left a portion of his army behind to ensure order. Additionally, Caesar brought along a number of Gallic chiefs, whom he deemed untrustworthy as a means to monitor them monitor them closely during the campaign. The departure point for this ambitious invasion uh, was identified as Portus Itius, marking a well-planned and determined effort by Caesar to ensure the success of a second invasion. The preparation underscored Caesar's intent not just to land in Britain, but to protect Roman power effectively and secure a stronger foothold. So a fellow called Titus Labinus, or yeah, Labinus, was tasked with the remaining um, back at Portus Itis, or Itius, uh, to manage regular shipments of resupply. See, the Romans completely thought this one through. The military contingent of the fleet was augmented by a collection of trading vessels manned by Roman and provincial captains from across the empire, alongside local Gauls eager to exploit the trade prospects presented by the Roman invasion. To ensure a daytime landing, the Roman fleet set sail from France in the evening, relying on favourable winds to aid their crossing of the channel. However, by midnight, the winds faltered, and the tide carried them too far northeast. At dawn, Britain was visible off to their left, 
prompting them to row and utilise the changing tide to reach the landing site. Upon approaching Britain, Caesar noted that the Britons, initially poised to contest the landing, retreated upon witnessing the magnitude of the Roman fleet. They withdrew to higher ground, like a strategic move to buy more time to consolidate their forces. Caesar's forces made landfall without immediate opposition and swiftly commenced their search for the British army, indicating Caesar's eagerness to engage and establish a foothold on British soil. Caesar assigned Quintus uh, Artius the responsibility of overseeing the beachhead, allocating him forces equivalent to a legion for the construction and defence of the base. Without delay, Caesar initiated a nocturnal march 12 miles inland, leading to an encounter with British forces at the river crossing, likely along the river store. The Britons launched an assault but were repelled, subsequently attempting to regroup within a fortified woodland area, possibly the hill fort at Bigbury Wood in Kent. But despite their efforts, they faced another defeat and dispersed. Given the late hour and Caesar's unfamiliarity with local terrain, he decided against further pursuit and established a base camp. The following morning, as Caesar prepared for an advance, he received distressing news from Artius a storm had once again wreaked havoc on the Roman fleet anchored offshore, resulting in significant damage and the loss of about 40 ships. This incident highlighted Rome, the Romans' lack of experience with the Atlantic and the Channel's tidal forces and its storms. While Caesar might have overstated the damage to undercome his subsequent recovery efforts, it underscored a lapse in planning, considering the similar setbacks faced the previous year. Responding quickly, Caesar recalled the forward legions and focused on fleet repairs. Over the ensuing ten days, his men tirelessly worked on beaching and mending the ships by constructing, uh, or constructing new fortified encampments. By the 1st of September, Caesar was stationed on the coast from which he had planned to, or which he had penned a letter to Cicero. It was around the same time Caesar likely learned of his daughter, Julia, who was married to uh, Pompey Magnus, hence that's what helped formed the original triumvirate, was she died during childbirth. Cicero withheld his response respecting Caesar's period of mourning. Following the coastal engagements, Caesar redirected his forces uh, towards the Stour, discovering that the Britons, under the leadership uh, of, wait for this now, Cassivellianus, right, uh, had regrouped. This guy was a northern warlord previously in conflict with many British tribes and who had usurped the throne, forcing uh, a prince into exile. He was now appointed the commander of the United British Forces in response to the Roman invasion. Initial skirmishes, which saw the death of the Roman tribune Quintus Liberius Durus, yielded no decisive outcome. A significant British assault on the Roman foraging party was ult ult uh, ultimately thwarted and the Britons suffered heavy losses due to Roman cavalry. Uh, Recognising the futility of direct confrontation, the Britons disbanded most of the army, relying instead on guerrilla tactics with their 4,000 chariots to try and hinder the Romans. This approach proved effective until the Romans reached the Thames. There, Caesar encountered fortifications and underwater stakes at the only viable crossing. It was defended vigorously by the Britons. Ancient accounts suggest Caesar deployed a war elephant, causing panic among the Britons, allowing his forces to cross into Cassavellius's territory. This episode, however, debated and may be conflated with Claudius's letter or Claudius's later campaign. So the Romans pushed on, and faced with defeat, they negotiated surrender through ter uh, terms through Commius, agreeing to hostages, an annual tribute, and peace with some of the other tribes on the island. By late September, Caesar prepared to return to Gaul, leaving no Roman forces. Uh, behind to enforce these terms, and the fulfilment of the tribute remains uncertain. Despite the apparent lack of wealth in Britain, as noted by Cicero, the expedition marked a genuine invasion, establishing Roman dominance and extracting concessions from the Britons. Caesar's leniency reflected his pragmatic need to return to Gaul before the onset of stormy weather, highlighting the strategic and symbolic victories of his British campaigns. Now, the aftermath of all of this, later 
uh, Commius, initially an ally of Caesar, defected to join Vercingetorix during the rebellion against Rome. We'll learn all about that next week. So, Caesar secured what he needed to do in Britain. He brought with him a massive, massive force. And ultimately, he managed to secure a decent foothold, told all the Britons to behave themselves now, or he'll come back given out, and then he wanted to withdraw back to Gaul. The worry now was the last remaining link of this triumvirate. What had happened when Caesar, Crassus and Pompey met at the second triumvirate, some weeks back, Caesar got an extension of his consulship, or of his proconsulship. Um, Ma uh, Pompey Magnus got to keep his control over Spain. And Crassus, feeling the itch for military glory, well, he managed to go to Syria to fight a war. It didn't turn out terribly well. He faced the Parthians. These guys were every bit of a match to the Romans. He brought a very few legions with him, and Crassus was killed in battle. Crassus now lay dead. The last bond between Caesar and Pompey Magnus, his daughter Julia, she's now dead. And all the while, Pompey is getting very uncomfortable with the rising fame of Caesar. This was not good news at all. So what do we know about the ancient Britons? Well... Caesar first hand's observations of Britain were confined to East Kent and the Thames Valley, yet he managed to offer a depiction of the island's geography and meteorology. Or meteorology. Uh, while his measurements may have not been entirely accurate and possibly influenced by the Greek explorer, his broad conclusions remain pertinent. This comes from the commentaries of the Gallic Wars, right? Caesar noted that Britain's climate was milder than some of Gaul's, with less harsh winters. He described Britain as having a triangular shape, one side facing Gaul. He mentioned that this side, starting from Kent and facing east to south, stretched about 500 miles. He observed another side facing west, towards Hispania and Hibernia, which he estimated to be half the size of Britain. With the Isle of Man, or Mona as it was known, and potentially other smaller islands situated midway between Britain and Hibernia. On this aspect, he committed or commented on the shorter nights compared to the continent reduced from precise timekeeping with water, debunking the myths uh, of excluded darkness during the winter. This side, according to him, measured 700 miles. The third side faced north with no land directly opposite and was thought to be 800 miles long, giving the island a total circumference of approximately 2,000 miles. So before Caesar got here, the Romans lacked detailed information about Britain's harbours, suitable landing sites, rendering Caesar's discoveries particularly valuable for future Roman, and mili uh, Roman military and commercial endeavours. The reconnaissance by the Romans prior to the first invasion identified Dover's natural harbour, although Caesar was compelled to land on an open beach both years, possibly due to Dover's inability to accommodate his larger force. By the area of Claudius and his invasion, Roman knowledge of Britain had expanded significantly thanks to a century of trade, diplomacy and multiple evasion attempts. It's plausible that the intelligence collected during 55 and 54 BC were preserved in Rome's state records, later aiding Claudius in planning his successful conquest. Now, Biggin Hill is just beneath us, lads. I'm going to stay going until we land. How's that? Biggin Hill, feel free to do a touch and go. But we're going to be doing a full stop up at London's Luton. So Biggin Hill, just beneath us, lads. A famous RAF site. Biggin Hill. You ever watched the Battle of Britain? The Britons mainly utilised chariots in warfare, uh, which presented a novel strategy to the Romans, who were accustomed to chariots for transport and racing rather than combat. Caesar detailed the Briton chariot tactics, highlighting their initial disruptive charges, the hurling of weapons to break enemy lines, followed by warriors dismounting to fight on foot. This combination of mobility and infantry stability, honed through rigorous training, allowed charioteers extraordinary control and agility. Caesar noted Druidism, the significance within British culture, suggesting its origins in Britain with subsequent spreads to Gaul. This institution, revered for its comprehensive teachings, drew individuals from Gaul to Britain, 
for education in its doctrines, underlying the cultural and spiritual connection between the two regions. Druidism, Druids, the, the Druids, they were in Ireland as well, a lot of Druids, uh, that was the, the religious order, pagan beliefs, many gods, all this sort of stuff. Caesar was motivated by the potential for tribute and trade. He remarked on the abundance of cattle and the use of brass and iron rings as currency. While he mentioned tin production in the Midland and iron along the coasts, these observations were somewhat misplaced. The primary tin trade, significant for attracting traders, uh, actually concentrated in Cornwall and Devon to the southeast and southwest. Caesar's limited inland expeditions reaching only as far as Essex likely contributed to his misunderstanding, shaping his perception of Britain's economic resources based second-hand reports rather than direct observations. So the outcome, well, we know what's happened. Caesar has secured a legacy that he made to Britain, but he didn't keep any Romans on site to, you know, control the area and keep it moving. Roman dominion paving the way for future annexation efforts well, it would take a hundred years before Romans would step back foot into Britain, right? So next week, next week, the Gallic War series continues. Caesar leaves Britain. He heads back to Gaul, where there's all sorts of messing going on. Revolts happening left, right and centre. And they're all being controlled and orchestrated by a legend. Vercingetorix is his name. And there's going to be a flight that'll take us from London Luton. And we're going to head all the way back down into familiar territory out towards kind of near Dijon as we go to a historical site known as Elysia. There is some custom scenery available for our flight next week. It's a custom POI that was created by our very own Jeppesen 2001. And it features a statue of Vercingetorix. So I'll make that available during the week. And next week, we're going to fly to that location. Alicia is the final battle. Hello, London. Alicia is the final battle place of the Romans against the Gauls. It's a fascinating story. And uh, the scenery that we have depicts that of Vercingetorix. And uh, we'll be checking it out. The Siege of Alicia, a defining moment in the Gallic Wars, saw Caesar's tactical genius and military might clash with the Gallic valour led by Vercingetorix. This encounter, marked by strategy, siegecraft, and the indomitable will of both Romans and Gauls, culminated in a decisive confrontation that would shape the fate of Gaul. As we explore this crucial event, expect to delve into the strategies employed, the hardships endured by both besiegers, and of course, we're going to be flying in incredible aircraft. We're going to be in the DC-6, the Douglas DC-6, for next week. Next week will be part 9 of the Gallic War series and after that part 10 we return to Rome with a full summary and also the next steps of what happens in that timeline once Caesar crosses the Rubicon. Elea e acta est. The die has been cast. Really fascinating stuff right? It's amazing stuff. So we're now over London on Dinium as we continue on. And we're going to do a landing up in, um, we're going to land in Luton, right? So let's have an old preview here of Luton. The weather's really nice. This is live weather still. So uh, Luton, let's have a look. So we'll go back to airports and get out of this. London, Luton. Let's go and have a look. So if you look at the weather, uh, winds are 260 at 7 knots. No clouds. That's pretty good. Uh, if we have a look at information on the runway, so... It's going to favour runway 25. Runway 25. If we have a look at charts, we'll go approach. Is there an ILS? Uh, we have an ORNAV. We have an ILS for 25. Let's open up the chart. So our ILS frequency for this is going to be 10915. 109.15. So we we'll go to our gadget. And we're going to go 10915. Enter. And swap. So 10915, that is our ILS approach. 10915, final cruise is going to be 254 degrees. Uh, 254 degrees. Uh, so if we go to... Localizer. There she be. Let's go heading mode. 
engage heading mode, arm approach, and our course needs to be, what did we say it was, lads, sorry? Course 254. 254 is already set. And we're looking good. So DME, are we reading? Yes, 13 miles out. Perfecto. Okay, let's do a little bit of work here. So we're going to say, change this devil. We're going to start descending here at 1,000 feet per minute. We're going to change our altitude. Let's go to 2,500 feet. Arm, engage, and vertical speed. 1,000 feet. While we're doing this, we're going to bring some power back. And let's see what happens. I lived in Luton in the 1950s and the 60s, and you went to school there, says Scorpio. Nice! Home of good old EasyJet. Indeed. Dougal, did you run out of fuel earlier on? <laughs> Patrick is away. You take care of my dude. Enjoy yourself. Recommendation London at night time is stunning. The whole area at night time is stunning. Take a moment. Look at that. Oh, look at that. Isn't that beautiful? Hello, fireflies. Beautiful. All right, okay, let's have a quick look. So what are we saying? Runway 25, yeah? So we're here. So we need to change our heading, lads. So current e in heading mode, we're on a heading of 334. Let's go to the right. I would say 005 would be safe-ish. So you continue on. Uh, torque power is good. Inertia separator back on. All our lights are doing what they need to do. Fuel check is good. And we continue our approach. You were flying the Spectre for a bit there. Ooh. Uh, you got to the UK. Jamie, we're just in the UK. How are we going for time? We're almost perfect. Almost perfect. Who plans these? <laughs> Right, watch our speed here now. 200 knots. We're uh, descending nicely. Turn this gadget off. Rambog Mord made that dial, by the way. Absolutely stunning. So we're on heading mode with our approach armed. And I'm not too worried. This is slightly off at the moment, but it's grand. I'm just trying to put a bit of diff uh, distance between ourselves and the runway. Because I don't want it to be too tight. We don't want it too tight coming in, yeah? So we're going to remain in this heading for a moment, then we're going to turn left, and then we'll see what happens. All right. This is the last airport of the night. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. And I just want to say, guys, thank you all so very, very much indeed for tuning in tonight. Uh, those of you watching on Twitch, the support has been absolutely insane. Uh, and to our friends on YouTube, thank you very, very much indeed. Do be sure to hit the like, subscribe, get notified button. Uh, keeps you up to date when there's content coming out on the channel. Uh, continuing with our review series, uh, we have another review coming out this Saturday. And uh, what else? I have other videos in the pipeline as well uh, as we plan some stuff. And of course, if you want to recommend anything, well, let me know on Discord uh, or in the comment section on uh, on YouTube if you'd like to see something um, reviewed, right? Uh, Briggsy, good to see you. When is the next uh, Chinook Ops? When they release it? Yeah, so... Uh, with the Chinook, right, there's a bit of kind of mad feedback on it. Some folks aren't too happy about it, but Miltech are using the video as a way to... It's actually quite clever. They're using the video as a way to get feedback rather than releasing the aircraft and, like, you know, upsetting the masses. It's a smart way of figuring out, hey, some people are saying that's wrong, that's not right, that's wrong, that's not right. So the comments in the video are helping Miltech say, ah, we'll, we'll fix that if we can, you know? Kane Lafford is away. You take care, my dude. Thank you so much for coming in. And uh, have a great day tomorrow. Okay, things are going to start happening quickly here. Two and a half thousand feet. Uh, reset our barrow. Let's go 1500 feet. Arm. Autopilot. V speed, a thousand feet per minute. Down you go. And um, we're going to start changing our heading now. Watch the speed, Murph. Okay, zero, 030. Zero. Nav mode is armed, so I'm hoping she's going to approach mode. Uh oh. Why aren't you going to approach? That's interesting. Is she on approach?
Yeah, she's on approach mode. Sweet. No, it's not. What are you doing, plane? Why didn't approach mode work? Okay, approach mode is now dialed in. Let's see what she can do here. Drop the gear, slow us right down. She's hardly going to make that, is it? We're well below the glide, but let's see what happens. First notch of flaps coming in. Yaw dampener disengaged. Is the phenom any good? Pretty good, man. Pretty good. After your parachute incident, can you tell us or tell now when the weather is turning? Very much so, yes. <laughs> Very much so. I think we're okay here. I think she's going to try and get us in. Watch your speed, Murph. Laps 30. Yaw dampener off. Gear down, three green. Let's see what happens here. Sports vans. Don't stall. Oh, she ain't liking this. Autopilot off my airplane. Don't like what she's trying to do to us. Yeah, it is going to be hairy. We might have to go missed here. We might. I reckon I can save it. I didn't listen to Captain Gaiman. I, I waited too long. That's what happened, lads. I waited too long. But it's grand. We're going to ramble in here now. Watch your speed. Flaps is at 30. Gear is down. Y'all dumping her off. We're gone visual, so we just need to take our little time here. Okay, we're very high. Get the nose down. Nine knots of wind. That'll calm down completely. High and fast. We're not terribly fast. 100 knots, but we're high. We're going to correct all this now, though. So we're getting onto the glide slope. We have our lateral point. Okay, we're good. Continue approach. Speed about 105. Easy now. Hello, Luton. Good owl easy, Jet. Easy. Easy. You be careful here because the runway slopes up. Okay, power to idle. Watching the flare. Watch the flare. Gentle kiss. Touchdown. 195, we felt that. Warning, drop pitch. We're quite okay. We're in beta. Beta out. Flaps in. Take it out of beta. There we go. 195, little bit on the... Oh, Jesus, me back. But we're all right. Hey, we'll taxi down here. Keep an eye. High and fast. All as well. Hey, we got down. 195, a little bit on the heavy side. Ah, oh, so many people. This is going to be awesome. I'll get out your way here now in a second and uh, we'll run back to have a look at everyone. There's Bellbro down there in a Fuga. Nicely done. So we still got a few people coming in. How are we looking? Right director off. Warning, trim. Stab trim is having a laugh at us. Uh, she needs to come down a bit. WM flight sim got 34 feet per minute. Nice, man. Nice. All right, all right. So I guess I'll turn around. Hello. BAE 146. Look at that. That's stunning. Beautiful aircraft. Look at the state of it, lads. It's beautiful. This is awesome. We have a ton of people here. 
When are we going to do Quantum River? Oh, we'll do it again soon, but if, great to see you, mate. Yeah, Quantum's always good fun, isn't it? And here they are. You know the drill? Flash the lights, move the ailerons, do all sorts of stuff. Look at all the aircraft type. Can we name all the aircraft? PC-12, P-38 Lightning, beautiful. TBMs, MB-339, Fuga. More TBMs. TBM-850, MB-339, A-10s, Fugas. 146. Absolutely gorgeous. Awesome flying, guys. Absolutely awesome flying. Guess I'll turn around. So tonight, friends, we departed Mannheim back in Germany, flew to Brussels, overhead uh, Calais, Dunkirk, then into Britain, flew over Biggin Hill, and we've done a full stop here at London's Luton Airport. Now, next week, there's a whole lot happening next week, so we're going to be flying the DC-6, departing from this very airport, and we're going to head back down to the south of France. So the DC-6, is it's I'm really looking forward to that. I haven't flown in the DC-6 in quite some time. Beautiful London, lads, as I nearly take everyone out. Wombat, good to see you. I literally taxied in front of you. And Sir Scott as well. You had a moment of, Jesus. But uh, that was a lot of fun, lads. That was a lot of fun. You're on the active, Murph. Listen, I paid for the runway. <laughs> hey, McLeod, good to see you, man. Right, let's bring it in here for a stop. Off the side of the runway, please. And we'll go into our little camera. And we'll focus in on you guys. What an absolutely brilliant flight. So much fun getting to fly with you guys. And uh, don't tell anyone about the story I told you about me and my, uh, what I get up to. Uh, right, do you know. So uh, listen, that was so much fun, lads. We're back to you this coming Wednesday uh, as we bring you the news, all the news for Flight Simulation. And then on Friday night, um, well, we have a, a bit of an event. We're going to be flying down in the Gulf, down the Middle East. And... Uh, when we're finished our flying, we're going to go down to uh, Yas Island in Abu Dhabi. And we're going to do some racing, would you believe it, in flight simulation. And I'm planning to take the Juice Goose from Parallel 42. But I think it'd be a little bit rude if we didn't at least try a lap or two in some general aviation aircraft. So a bit of fun planned for Friday night. And um, next week then, of course, we're going to be continuing on with the Gallic War series. And we're going to be flying in the Douglas DC-6 and uh, looking forward to that one. So thank you all so very, very much indeed uh, for joining me on this flight. Uh, getting to share this with you, it's its just incredible. These experiences in the sim, I love this. And uh, I really do appreciate uh, you guys being here. Uh, to everyone on Twitch, the support lads, thank you very, very much indeed. Captain Gaiman, big shout out to you. Uh, thanks for helping me along, um, you know, and not, you know, breaking it. And uh, to our mods as well, lads, awesome, awesome stuff. And uh the, the back chatter is definitely hilarious this evening. And to everyone here on YouTube, thank you very, very much indeed as well, guys. I really do appreciate you coming in to watch some stunning 4 k of the streams. And uh, yeah, I'll, uh, I'm going to catch us now on Wednesday. That's our next stream. So until then, thank you all so very much. Have a lovely evening. Let's get through the week and we'll check in with you Wednesday at the Halftime Show. Until then, you take care. God, right... Jesus, what's her speed? 70 knots. I don't know about you, lads, but I'm getting a bad feeling about this one, you know? Your ass, boy. Come here to me. Oh, she's going to stall. Steady. Steady. 60 knots. Jesus, look at this. Look at the legs on that. Look at the state of this. We're not even climbing. Oh, balls. Get Few men even considered the possibility of life on other planets.